What is up, movie friends? Welcome back to Raiders of the Lost Podcast. I'm Anthony. And I'm James, and this is episode 54. We are doing the Dark Knight Trilogy, easily my most watched movies of all time in my life. Specifically, Batman Begins in the Dark Knight. I've seen these movies way too many times. I can't even count it, like just the amount of times I've just... Just not just to watch them, just to put them on while I'm doing work or yeah. cooking or something. Just AMC used to play Batman Begins all the time, and then they both were on Netflix for a while. Yeah, too. for a while. Even though yeah. we have the Blu-rays, it's just so much easier <laughs> to put the Netflix on. But I mean, I've seen Batman Begins so many times, and I think The Dark Knight's the greatest superhero movie ever made. I don't think it'll ever be taught by anything. And you know, there's no denying that we have a biased opinion about Christopher Nolan on the show. We are hardcore fans of his. Mm-hmm. We've done nothing but praise him. He's an incredible filmmaker with immense vision and excellent ex- execution ambition his original ideas are challenging and these films are also just as bold and as, and as bishi- ambitious as his other films yeah and batman is my favorite superhero uh i think obviously because of that the famous um reason that everyone else gives if they have him as their favorite is because he doesn't have any superpowers and he's just a man um fighting crime and doing these amazing things and i think he's just the most relatable character of all comic books and the thing with the previous films of Batman is they're very good. There's some really good ones, like Tim Burton did a great job. and um, Yeah, Batman with Michael Bat- Keaton's yeah, great. Yeah, Batman and Michael Keaton's great, and the TV show is a lot of fun. But uh, the, the movies before Nolan, they were always about style over anything. And they were also driven by toys and manufacturing because the, the Warner Brothers would design these films with toys in mind so the batmobile was designed specifically to be able to sell the toys to kids and the same thing with the bat suit and gotham and so it was always about the underlying theme of they're trying to sell as many toys and as much merchandise as possible like for example batman returns that's why in batman and robin all merchandise it's, I mean, yeah, it's a toy commercial these studios make more money yeah. off toys than movies yeah that's a lot of people don't understand yeah. that you'd be surprised and then with this film nolan decided that he wanted to uh, forego the idea of toys and merchandise and just try to make a great film uh, and do the best they could with great filmmaking, acting, production design, and a, a fantastic crew and team around him to craft a, a, a incredible, not just a comic book movie, but just inc- incredible crime dramas. Yeah, exactly. And again, my, Batman's my favorite superhero too, has been since I was a kid. Um, similar reasons, you know, because he's not, he has no superpowers besides his immense, immense wealth, you know, I'm trying to get some bags too, so that's really cool to check, to think about, <laughs> just kidding, but um, he's got immense wealth, uh, he's super intelligent, uh, genius intellect in a lot of the comic books, uh, he's, he's got a lot of trauma in his past, which drives him to find things to do for the good of humanity and good of Gotham City, he walks this line of darkness and light, he's just, he's not a simple hero, he's complex, and when you're talking about all superheroes, yes, they have flaws, and you can probably compare most to Iron Man because they're very similar, orphan billionaires, geniuses. Um, still, Batman's, when you're trying to dive into like a character study, he's the most material to work from. He's the most interesting superhero probably ever. I mean, because Bruce Wayne is just as infamous as Batman. These movies in particular, I think they get falsely identified as gritty. People like to use the term gritty when defining the dark knight and these batman movies you always see critics and people saying oh it's a gritty comic book movie but it's that's not accurate what it is is it's realistic and chris chris nolan brought the element of realism to the comic book genre and by and he did that in a few ways first of all like we say he took style out of it and he he focused more on the character and humanity of bruce wayne and what what would drive someone to do this in real life and also in terms of gotham city because the gotham in this world is very realistic. The other Gotham cities before this, they were very fantastical. Um, they seem like out of a comic book, which is great. So what they were going for, and a lot of the depictions of Gotham in the comic books are very um, fantastical and surrealist as well. But uh, by setting it in a believable world, uh, I think it was really smart that there are other cities involved. Like uh, in Dark Knight, there's Hong Kong, and um, they he filmed a lot of the sets in Gotham City in various American cities to give that uh, relatable quality to it and the recognizable landmarks, not specific landmarks, but you can recognize architecture. Like you can recognize it's definitely Pittsburgh and the Dark Knight Rises and stuff like that. And so he made the world believable by setting it in our world. And at the time, we're talking when Batman Begins came out, it's the early 2000s. We'd been experiencing these new kind of realistic superhero movies with Blade and X-Men and Spider-Man and like maybe not as realistic as Batman, but putting them in the modern world in a realistic way. And those are very well made and successful, but Sam Raimi's Spider-Man blew the world up with 
box office of eight hundred and twenty five million dollars, which was absurd. Yeah. I mean X Men and Blade, they were they're making two hundred mil, two hundred fifty mil. No one expected that. But eight hundred and twenty five million dollars for a superhero movie. It really showed the immense potential of superhero films, of comic book films, what they would eventually achieve. Um and these these filmmakers, they were they were effectively put all these superheroes again in realistic worlds. Uh because they were so much better because the last two Batmans that we saw were just terrible, horrible movies. They were just not entertaining. I mean, what, the suits have nipples. Like, what are we doing here? What are we <laughs> like doing? We, like we said earlier, they're making the movies to sell toys. That was yeah. it. And Warner Brothers, they wanted to reboot Batman because it's such uh, a valuable commodity to have as a studio. And but, but they were trying to figure out who was the right filmmaker to approach and take this project on. And Chris Nolan was pretty hot at the time. He had made Memento. He uh, got an Oscar nomination for the screenplay, and that was that blew up everywhere in terms of independent films. And I think it won a couple of awards at Sundance and Toronto film festivals. And so his name was getting out there. Um, but then also he made insomnia for Warner brothers. Yeah. And after that came out, it was an insomnia actually made over a hundred million dollars. It's a really good movie. It's a great it's movie. A hidden gem, but it was, it's the rare quality of a, a critically acclaimed and very successful over a hundred million dollars for any movie under a budget of 50 mil is great. And so that I making insomnia successful, gave them the opportunity to pitch his take on Batman because what happens when a, a studio wants to make a, a new like franchise is they reach out to a bunch of filmmakers and producers and they're, and they're, and they're like, we want to make a new Superman. We want to make a new uh, Iron Man, whatever. Uh, and they, they uh, put out feelers to filmmakers to offer pitches for their takes on the project and a bunch of filmmakers will pitch their takes on the on the character, and then the studio will pick their favorite. And Nolan, I think, had the best take by making it a realistic, authentic character piece instead of something overblown and overbloated for, for style. And it's not just Nolan, because David S. Goyer was essential to Christopher Nolan in telling the story of Batman Begins and the origin story of Batman, because Christopher Nolan will tell you himself, he's no comic book expert. He's, he's not super familiar with the lore. Obviously, he was a fan, I'm sure, like everybody else was, but he needed somebody who's an expert in comic book world, an expert on Batman, and he reached out to Goyer, who explained to Nolan how he would do it if he was going to make a Batman movie. And then, obviously, he took Goyer on, and Goyer accepted the role as, as a co-writer and co-developing the story and telling this realistic version of Batman. You know how they wrote it? Uh, in diners, right? Yeah, they yeah. wrote it in the same diner at the same table every day for, like, three months. The waitresses and waiters are probably like, I who are these guys? And then they don't realize <laughs> that they're about to make the most successful comic book franchise of all time, <laughs> up until, you know, Marvel, obviously. Yeah, yeah. Um, but then the story... What they went into, it's, it's again, it's not just Batman. It's a character study of Bruce Wayne and his humanity. It's the logic behind this character, why Batman becomes Batman. We've never really seen an origin story of Batman on film or TV. It's dabbled in the comics, but really doesn't even dive into it that often in the comic books. And you, usually we see a fully rein, or fully full incarnation of Batman already been doing it for years. That's what we've been used to. And all that you would ever see in the older films is the flashback sequence of his parents' death, where as this film, it decided to tell the origin story, a complete origin story from a kid until he decides to become Batman and how he becomes Batman. And I, I love Batman Begins because we see how he comes up with a suit and he gets the Batmobile and uh, he builds this character up um, piece by piece throughout the film until uh, the third act when he's finally a fully fledged Batman. And I, I just adore that about this film. And uh, I think Batman Begins uh, created this hunger for people to see origin stories. Yeah. Because after this, Everyone wanted to see what's Superman's origin story. What are these comic book characters' origin stories? And so I think the origin story that is so popular now is a, is thanks to Batman Begins' success. But again, Batman and Bruce Wayne just have so much depth to explore as characters. And obviously, Batman fights the criminal underworld of Gotham uh, as a way to get against the criminality and avenge the death of his parents. But ultimately... As we learned through this franchise, this trilogy specifically, his whole purpose is to become a transcendent symbol to the citizens of Gotham to bring hope to the city, to try to to try to change the entire city as one man. And it's so admirable and, and incredible to watch this happen, to see one person just try to change an entire city. And you see throughout the three films, the the success he has, the mistakes he makes, the the great trauma he experiences, the the pain, the falls, the the in, enormous falls as well as the rising through the fire at the end and it's a really incredible story what i really like about batman and the world itself is that 
uh, the scope is never too big. It's never the world is at stake or there's a, a light beam that's going to destroy the planet. It's always, uh, the stakes are always held within the walls of Gotham City. And sometimes they're even very small. And I think it's the smaller scope uh, works better rather than with something like Man of Steel where uh, the entire world is going to end. Because if an audience is watching a movie, especially the first or second movie in a franchise, and the world is going to end if they don't win, uh, obviously it, there's this like subconscious feeling, understanding that we have that we know obviously they're going to stop the world from ending because then there wouldn't be a sequel to the movie. And so with these films, the stakes are never that large because in the first film, it's just uh, Gotham's at stake. And then in the second film, the, the soul of Gotham is at stake. And especially at the climax of the film, the real stakes are the two boats and whether they'll survive. And with that situation, it's an example of, you know, the Joker could b blow both these boats up and we, there can still be a sequel. So we feel like when we watch the stakes they were, where they're a lot smaller, then it feels more believable. And we accept those stakes and think that they can turn out the, for the worse and still have a sequel. So it makes us buy into it more. And also, I think that Nolan made this movie Batman Begins the first one without the plan of ever making a sequel. I know he sets it up at the end with the Joker card uh, that Gordon gives Batman, but still, there's not a single hint or anything of future villains throughout the entire film until that scene at the very end. And I think that's what makes it so special is it's a great story. It's a great film on its own. And it's essentially, it's a comic book movie, but it's a great tragedy as well. Yeah, exactly. And I feel like the Joker card at the end is just like a cherry on top. Yeah. He had no intention of like, of making a second one and and nowadays you see an origin story for a character and uh, they won't even get to the the parts of the character that you want to see because they're setting them up for the next one and then sometimes they miss the opportunity because they were so focused on making more films after that the first one that they they don't make a great first film and so I think his Nolan's Nolan's um, idea of filmmaking especially for the for the uh, comic book movies is just make the best single movie you can each time and then if we want to make another one down the line, we'll figure it out. But let's just make self-contained movies from now. I, I think it's pretty obvious that's what they did with Iron Man and Marvel. They saw Batman Begins. They're like, let's let's ground this. Let's just focus on this character. Let's not worry about connecting all these future dots that we're going to set up in the they future were, of they MCU. Were, they were planning that for Iron Man. They were planning it, but in the first film, there, there aren't a ton of... They, they spend so much time with the characters in the story. Well, so so you're right, but they... So they had the plan, obviously, for the universe, not as fleshed out, oh, yeah, as, yeah. obviously, but they did use Batman Begins as the major inspiration for mm -hmm. Iron Man, like you just said. If Batman Begins didn't come out and it wasn't so critically successful and, and fantastic, John Favreau's Iron Man would have probably been a lot different because mm -hmm. it, it's, it gave them the blueprint for how they could uh, depict Iron Man in a film. And so you're absolutely right about that. They even have very similar structures in their stories in terms of the flashbacks in the beginning and going back to, to how he got in the situation. And obviously, he's not going back to his youth and everything. But still, mm -hmm. obviously, we won't talk too much about Iron Man. Yeah. I'll end it right there. We'll go back to Batman because this is, again, the greatest franchise. I think it's the greatest trilogy ever made, probably. It's, it's like up there with The Godfather, The Lord of the Rings, and Dark Knight trilogy. Those are, like I think, my top three favorite trilogies. Yeah, it's, it's a, and Star Wars, the first Yeah, the trilogy. original Star Wars. Yeah. Born, uh, Born's yeah. great too. Yeah, and I think that uh, uh, Dark Knight Rises gets a lot of flack, but I think that it's a, an amazing third film in the franchise. I think it's I, close to a masterpiece, I, honestly. I really adore it. Because I think Dark Knight Rises, you really need to understand what the movie's actually about to yeah. really get it. And also the filmmaking in Dark Knight Rises is just on another level. The production, cinematography, like everything about it is just a, a incredible, huge-scale, epic filmmaking um, and it's the best craftsmanship there is in superhero films. And I think that Nolan was a, a great director for these films in terms of he understood when he was making these movies that he needed to have fine craftsmanship, so a great cinematographer, a great production designer. Wally Fisher, cinematographer. Well, yeah, yeah, and a um, great editor. He has He's always had pretty much the same team for all of his movies, but also combining that with an excellent cast. So obviously there have been great actors that have had acted in superhero movies before this film, but this film is stacked. There are Oscar caliber, there are several Oscar caliber actors in the first movie. And so to see an ensemble with these high quality revered actors really brought um, relatability and intrigue and, and quality to the film itself. So I think he was really smart where he didn't just hire a, a one star to play Batman. He, he hired 10 incredible actors. At the end of this episode, we will be doing our monthly podcast shout out for our top tier Patreon supporters. So our current $10 Patreon supporters will get a shout out at the end of this episode. So stay tuned for the end of that. 
in honor of this episode, we're going to do a very special giveaway contest. The winner of this giveaway contest will receive a Blu-ray copy of their favorite Dark Knight trilogy movie. Whether it be Batman Begins, The Dark Knight, or The Dark Knight Rises, the winner will receive a Blu-ray copy of that movie sent to them from us. And if you want, we'll sign it for you, too. Yeah, we'll sign it. We'll sign right on the disc. (laughs) (laughs) To enter the contest, all you have to do is subscribe to the YouTube channel, comment on this specific giveaway video, your favorite Dark Knight trilogy movie. Good luck, everyone. We'll announce a winner in a week. Your favorite Chris Nolan Batman film sent to you from us. And of course, yes, the cast in these films are phenomenal. And that's one of the great strengths of it is normally in a Batman film or a superhero film, the main great actors are just either the supervillains or the heroes. But we get so many other interesting characters that aren't superheroes. They're not supervillains played by high caliber actors with great performances. And they actually have characters with legit depth. And I mean, obviously, we, we got to start off with Christian Bale is one of my all time favorite actors. We've had several actors don the cape and cowl, but Christian Bale is my Batman. He always will be. I mean, I love Michael Keaton. I love Ben Affleck. And I am beyond excited to see Robert Pattinson as as the Batman. But Bale's always going to be my guy. Christian Bale was perfect, and I think he is the definitive Batman. No one had ever brought so much character and depth and levity to the character of Bruce Wayne and Batman. And I think he's he's the iconic epitome of what you can do with the character. And essentially, Christian Bale plays three roles. He plays Bruce Wayne, the real Bruce Wayne, uh, Bruce Wayne, the eccentric billionaire, the persona, and then he plays Batman. And he does all three roles brilliantly um, and with great nuance. And uh, he's able to blend the ferocity, the, the ferocity and power of Batman, along with the the modesty and. Um, and the good nature of Bruce Wayne. Yeah, and and Christian, yeah, he's playing three characters as well, but he's also playing three characters who all go through immense transformations throughout all three of the films. I mean, in the first act of the first movie, uh, Bruce Wayne has like four different personas and four different character traits, and in the beginning of the first film, he's full of anger and rage and cynicism at the the death of his family, and he's even a borderline killer and he, he wants to become a murderer which he's obviously saved from Rachel from doing and so he goes from that to somehow becoming this this beacon of hope for Gotham City and and taking all of his pain and his trauma and his trauma is his biggest character trait throughout the entire series to me is it's just a constantly in our face whether it's a representation of characters or or Gotham the city itself is a representation of his trauma but it's always there and it's always something that he he has to face and Eventually, again, what we talked about earlier is, is falling, but then rising and saving the city. And one of my favorite aspects to the character in all three of these films is that he fails a lot. He Batman fails many times, and he learns lessons, and he grows as a character. He's not just like the same plateaued character the whole time. He's not just, I'm Batman. There's a lot of depth to him, and then there's a lot of uh, uh, range to his story and his arcs, and he has his ups and downs as a character, and he, he, he falls down and builds himself up each movie. Christian Bale beat out a lot of really great actors for this role, uh, most prominently uh, Jake Gyllenhaal and Killian Murphy and Billy Crudup, and there are a bunch of really great actors up for Batman, and uh, there's, they, they held several auditions with people actually wearing the, the Val Kilmer suit, and Christian Bale was the only actor who came up with the idea to alter his voice while he was playing Batman in the suit to, for the auditions, and uh, as opposed to when he was playing Bruce Wayne, and uh, this set him apart from the other actors because he he was astute to know that if he's Batman, he needs to become like a monster. He needs to become like an animal, so he's not going to speak like a normal man. So he he developed that raspy, growly voice for his audition. And another really cool fact about the audition is that the actress who played Rachel Doss in all of the uh, in all of the screen test auditions with the actors playing Batman and Bruce Wayne was Amy Adams. Oh no way! So Amy Adams, she was doing a favor for the casting director of Batman Begins. And uh, they had her on board as the reader of Rachel Doss's character for all of these actors to read against. So if you look at there's footage online of like Christian Bale and Killian Murphy as Bruce Wayne and as Batman, the actress performing with them has her back turned to the camera, but it's actually Amy Adams. And then Christian Bale and Amy Adams have started in multiple movies together too, which is really cool. Mm. And Christian Bale, he's an incredibly fascinating guy, obviously incredibly talented and dedicated to his craft. Um, he started in a Spielberg film, Empire of the Sun, as a kid, so he's a child actor. It's one of the greatest child uh, actor. Uh, it's one of the greatest child performances ever. Yeah, and he actually got bullied from school as a kid from it, but stuck with acting as he got older out of a love for the craft. Um, obviously got his big break in 
got uh, mainstream fame with American Psycho. Uh, Christian Bale also has a photographic memory and can memorize his lines basically on the spot. And it's also very beneficial for stunt coordination and, and uh, blocking in films so that he doesn't really have to learn multiple movements more than more than once, really. Because, again, photographic memory and immense talent and dedication. You get one of the greatest actors to ever live. Yeah, and he's able to do the the performance of Bruce Wayne perfectly in terms of Bruce Wayne per- doing the performance of the the ego of Bruce Wayne, the persona of Bruce Wayne, because and it gets better with every movie where you can really see the difference between uh, not just Batman and Bruce Wayne, but the two Bruce Waynes. And I think with Dark Knight, he really uh, captured how there are really two sides to this man, and you can really see it when he's in public as the billionaire Bruce Wayne terms in terms of when he's uh, alone or with people like Rachel or Alfred where he's actually just a much different person than what how the uh, the world sees him and he's such a, a nuanced and terrific actor where he it makes it seem like it's different people every time even though it's the same actor portraying him and then we have the great Michael Caine who a lot of young people may not know this but Michael Caine was one of the biggest movie stars on the planet in his prime he's in a ton of action and spy films including the original Italian job and it's obvious that Nolan was probably a massive fan of Michael Caine since he puts him in he's put him in every single one of his movies since uh, Batman Begins yeah. and Caine's Alfred it's different than what we're used to with Alfred characters um, a lot of times in the comic books he's a little more capable or or more hands-on with with Batman and his and his actions in uh, terms of investigating too. Yeah, um, but really in this franchise in this in these stories, he's he's quite old compared to those other renditions of the character, and he's he's really mostly a father figure to Bruce, and he's a he's the person who keeps Bruce grounded when things get a little out of control or he's dealing with a lot of trauma or t- turmoil in his life. He's he also acts as Bruce's conscious a lot of the time. That's actually a great point, and all the previous movie adaptations, Alfred was reduced to just Bruce Wayne's butler, literally a butler, literally just a butler. That's all he. That's that was his entire service in all the films, just carrying uh, trays of food and drinks to to Bruce Wayne, and he had no actual depth or storylines at all. And with this film, when Michael Caine was approached for the role, he he thought it was kind of a joke, and he's like, "I'm not going to play the butler." And then Chris Nolan told him, "Oh no, you you have a much bigger." And more important role than that. And you're right, he does act as Bruce's conscious because he challenges him and questions him whenever he thinks that Bruce is going to make a mistake or he's uh, in, on the wrong path. And he always keeps him steady in terms of uh, how he's going about his his duties as Batman. And he helped raise Bruce, and he was Bruce's father figure, like you say, after his parents died. And so there's a strong bond between the two of them. And also, I think Michael Caine, his performance in, in the last film... Dark Knight Rises, it just is heartbreaking and heart-wrenching, especially when he abandons him. There are some really incredible emotional moments between these two characters in these films. Yeah, and even though um, Alfred says twice in the first film that he'll never give up on Bruce, we obviously have never. the never. We have the tragic conversation between him and Bruce in the in the final film where basically he's relieving Alfred of his duties because Alfred is trying to protect Bruce and doesn't want to see him die. And obviously, we'll get to Dark Knight Rises and how that's a uh, a subconscious decision of Bruce and what he's what path he's going down on purpose. Um, and then we have Gary Oldman as Jim Gordon, who's just the perfect character actor to to play Jim Gordon. Mm-hmm. The first time we saw like an image, a set image of of Gary Oldman in the character, we were like, oh my god, the mustache, the glasses, <laughs> it fits so well. He's such a phenomenal actor. He brings so much heart and and charisma to this character and it's he's almost just as famous and synonymous with batman as bruce wayne in the entire franchise and comic books yeah and just like butler uh, (laughs) (laughs) just like the butler (laughs) and just like alfred james gordon in most of the films has very little to do it's very minor roles and he's not even in all of the movies before this one he's not i didn't like until we began watching the cartoon show i didn't really think that jim gordon was that big of a person in the world just from the the Tim Burton movies that we had seen and uh, they they wisely made Gordon a main figure in this in this movie and he became one of the most important characters in the entire franchise especially by Dark Knight and Dark Knight Rises he is vital to the plot I think in Batman Begins um, they were not fully fleshed out with who he could have been the potential I think that Gordon was a little uh uh, less interesting and um, a little less charismatic as he was in the second two. I think Dark Knight, he's just he, they they uh, improved on him greatly for Dark Knight, made him a much better character. And then in Dark Knight Rises, he is one of the 
moral and emotional centerpieces of the film itself and he he gives one of the best performances in the third movie and so they he got the character got much better over the films and ended up becoming one of my favorite characters in the whole franchise and then morgan freeman plays lucius fox who's basically a genius scientific inventor who works at wayne enterprises and he uh basically is the person who designed all this tech that batman eventually starts to use as he starts fighting crime and he's an essential figure in the story um and and Morgan Freeman what can what more can you say about the guy he's, he's so charming he's 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 just got a great voice he's such a phenomenal actor he brings so much so much like comedy to all the scenes and the bow tie and nicety and he, he's just a really great guy on camera and I, I love watching him I can watch him all day on, on in a movie yeah I like Lucius because he's like the cue to James Bond for, for yeah, Bruce Wayne yeah kind of yeah you know what I mean and yeah like you said he just brings so much charisma and and heart and and a lot of wisdom to the scenes he's in along with a lot of humor some of the funniest parts of of the entire franchise are Lucius Fox lines with Bruce Wayne yeah going with back Bruce Wayne they're, they're hysterical and then um we have Katie Holmes and Maggie Gyllenhaal who share the role of Rachel Dawes, and she's an incredibly important character to Bruce Wayne as she is his closest friend, oldest friend. She's also the woman he loves, and though they never get to be together, he keeps the hope that they can be together when Batman is done through the first two films and even third film. But I think I think Rachel knows that Batman won't ever be over while Bruce is alive, and I think that's why she's more... Um, less hesitant to to date other people and move on with Har- move on to Harvey Dent in the second film. Yeah, and uh, Rachel her loss devastates Bruce and obviously puts him into turns him into a recluse and it has a, a devastating effect on his, on his entire life and uh, she is the only person he's ever loved and so obviously it has a tremendous impact on his life and uh, she is a, a, an important figure in Bruce Wayne's story. And musically, these films are some of the best film scores I've, I've heard in the last two decades. Hans Zimmer and James Newton Howard working on the first two films together, and Hans Zimmer taking on the third. And Hans is just a master of themes, and James Newton Howard's a, a very beautiful classical composer. Um, and I think they just fit really well coming up with the the music for these films. And a cool fact about the first album of Batman Begins is every track is a different uh, gene of bat title. Yeah. Although it makes it hard to remember the title names. <laughs> my, 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 I'm always like myotosis. For yeah, yeah. <laughs> and um, the reason why uh, Chris Nolan hired these two composers, because obviously it's very rare to have two composers, especially not a team. They're not a duo. They are extremely uh, accomplished composers individually. But he brought these two composers on because he wanted to um, create two different musical, uh, two different musical identities for the film in terms of Bruce Wayne and Batman. And so James Newton Howard was tasked with doing all of the Bruce Wayne music, and then Hans Zimmer was tasked with doing all the Batman music. And so all the scenes with Batman, all the action stuff, all the dun, dun, like all those super heart-pounding themes, the drums, all of that is Hans Zimmer. And then all the more um, classical, more beautiful, soft, emotional music, that's James Newton Howard, and they always play during the scenes of of Bruce, especially in Batman Begins, when he's like thinking about his past and doing flashbacks, and with Rachel, all those are James Newton Howard, and it, it created this incredible balance between the two characters. That it's not just happening visually and in the story, but musically as well. And then Hans Zimmer did the third one alone because James Newton Howard realized that Nolan and Zimmer had uh, an extremely close bond and working relationship, and he was kind of the 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 um, third wheel of the relationship. Although I'm sure they were obviously super supportive and wanted him on board, but he just felt that it was better for him if Hans did the third film on his own with with Chris Nolan. And you can't have a superhero film or a Batman film without great villains, and we get so many good ones. Um, I think it was really wise to save the Joker for a sequel if they were going to make one. Obviously, Scarecrow, Falcone, Maroni, uh, the the Joker. We got Raz Al Ghul, we got Bane, Talia Ghul, and just a phenomenal selection in terms of, of the history of the character. And then, like, again, like I said, saving Joker for the second film because this is kind of like what they did with Sherlock Holmes. I'm sure that Sherlock took a – the creators took a step from Batman Begins where they saved Moriarty for the second film, and then they just have Lord Blackwood in the first film save the second – the big baddie for the second film and just establish the characters in the first movie. Yeah, exactly. And the main villains in each film challenge Batman in different ways, whereas the first one's about – his morality and, and who he is as as a person with Ra's al Ghul. And the second one is, is challenging uh, in terms of trying to 
trying to handle chaos and and out in destruction and then the third film bane challenges him physically with his power and his physicality and so every villain offers up a different task and obstacle for bruce wayne as batman and they never repeat and they're always very unique um antagonists yeah and each film has its own main theme the first one you just kind of touched on these all the first batman begins deals with fear the dark knight deals with chaos and The Dark Knight Rises deals with pain. And overall, a major theme throughout this entire franchise and series is trauma. And Bruce Wayne overcoming his trauma, dealing with his trauma, facing his trauma, and, and rising from all that pain he has in his past. Fire rises. Fire rises. <laughs> <laughs> I had to. All right, let's get into Batman Begins. Are you ready? Uh, I was born ready. All right, you want to go first? I'm Batman. Uh, where were the other drugs going? Where were the drugs going? <laughs> <laughs> All right. Can't be believe wait, we waited 40 minutes for that. Yeah, I can't do it again. My voice. Batman Begins came out on June 15th in 2005. It was written and directed by Christopher Nolan and co-written by David S. Goyer. The film stars Christian Bale, Michael Caine, Liam Neeson, Katie Holmes, Gary Oldman, and Killian Murphy. The film grossed 373 million dollars on a budget of 150 million. Bruce Wayne undergoes intensive martial arts training with Henry Ducard, a member of the elusive League of Shadows. After Bruce discovers the League's true motives to destroy Gotham City, he returns to Gotham and assumes the name Batman to protect his city. Batman Begins is not just a great origin story, it's a great tragedy. The story is impeccable, it's the journey of a character dealing with the trauma of his present and past, trying to save his city, trying to use... What he can to bring hope to his city, which is is rotting. Again, the origin story for Batman never been done before in TV and film. And this world, it's so realistic to if Batman really existed, what would it be like? If if we took a realistic approach to it, how can we envision Batman? How can we envision the stakes of of crime and these super villains to an extent? And the story it's really about Bruce Wayne. Batman takes the second seat in all of these films. He's barely even in the third one, too. But Bruce Wayne is the heart of the story. It's about his emotions, his fear, his guilt, his pain, and his journey. And the reason why it works so well, like you said, is because it is a character piece. They aren't just superhero movies. They're character pieces about this character. And Chris Nolan was wise to adopt that intention when he made these films. And I think that this film... Uh, it, it redefined the idea of uh, what a superhero could be because Spider-Man was doing well, but all the other superhero movies weren't doing well. A Fantastic Four was failing. Like all these ad all these comic book adaptations, they weren't performing well, Elektra and Daredevil. But with Batman Begins, Chris Nolan redefined what was possible with the superhero film. And then obviously he, he improved upon it with The Dark Knight. And uh, this, this movie itself, not The Dark Knight, but Batman Begins inspired, like we said, Iron Man. It also inspired just the changing these franchise films to make them more realistic and make them more grounded and and based upon reality and based in character in terms of uh, there wouldn't the new James Bond franchise with Daniel Craig that was directly inspired by Batman Begins. The producers saw Batman Begins and wanted to create a more grounded, uh, reality driven James Bond film, and that's what led to Casino Royale and all the Daniel Craig movies. And so this new uh, grounded reality in terms of franchise films uh, owes it's all owed to Batman Begins doing it so well and showing the way essentially for how to make big budget movies and making them feel more authentic to reality. The second two films have fantastical, practical action opening scenes. The opening of Batman Begins is of Bruce as a child and where we learn how he develops his fear of bats and it's it, the thing with Batman and, and the reason he selects the symbol of the bat is because yes it's what he's afraid of as a kid when he falls down the well and he gets swarmed by all those bats and this now he's afraid of bats but he, it, he doesn't choose the bat because he's afraid of them the bat is a representation of his fear, which is a representation of his guilt and trauma because this fear of bats leads them to that opera scene where he's afraid of the characters on stage that look like bats, which he, he leads to him asking his parents to leave. And then obviously we know his parents get gunned down. So Bruce Wayne's fear is his source of guilt and trauma. And that's why he chooses this symbol of the bat. It's not just because he's afraid of bats. It's because 
the fear of bats is what triggers his guilt and trauma. And also his guilt that he feels at the expense of his parents' death, believing that it was his fault for their deaths, is what drives his anger. And the anger is something that Bruce Wayne deals with early in his life in the first act of the film in terms of uh, he's struggling to uh, overcome it and he's letting it over he's letting it fuel his actions which is why it leads to him wanting to murder chill out of revenge which Rachel stops and and the reason why he does this is because he doesn't know what to do with his rage and he doesn't know what to do with his anger and after this moment in the film it's not as though he it gets rid of his anger what happens is he is with through Batman he finds a, an outlet to channel his anger and his rage and all this power he has inside of him, and he puts he put he uses Batman to let it out, and so every the Batman is fueled by the anger that is caused by the guilt of his parents' death that he still has. And every time everyone watches this, listening, when you rewatch these movies again, which I'm sure you eventually will, when you're when you're watching the films and you're watching Bruce Wayne deal with his pain and his trauma and his fears, it's a direct reflection with. The city of Gotham itself, because after his parents' death, the city of Gotham starts to 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 decay and it's filled with corruption and the criminal underworld and organized crime wreak havoc on the city. And because there's no one there to help protect it because his parents were such great philanthropists and, and generous people to the city of Gotham because they benefited so greatly from being there that there's no hero there with, with his parents gone and it takes Bruce a long time to realize that if he wants to change something in his city, he has to kind of be what we, we've seen a lot of classical fiction is he's a king who has to leave his kingdom to sort of find himself and get the strength to come back and save his kingdom. That's a great point. And I think that's why the first act is so strong. And I think that the first act of Batman Begins, the first 40 minutes is... Some of my favorite 40 minutes in all of movies. I think it's an absolutely perfect first act to a movie. And ta Chris Nolan uses his uh, his famous time manipulation in terms of telling the story of Batman's of Bruce Wayne's origin in different uh, time variations from flashbacks and flash forwards and, and present day. And 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 it's a brilliant depiction of this character. And and it, it keeps it interesting. But because if they start from in chronological order, it'll be a much slower movie. But it, instead, it starts off with Bruce as a kid, he falls down the, the pit, and then it cuts to he, he's in prison in a foreign nation, and he has that fight with the other prisoners. And so and Chris Nolan deftly bounces back from childhood to adulthood, but, but pre-Batman adulthood, to show what this character went through and what caused the decision to make to become Batman because it's not a simple decision. A lot of things led to the creation of Batman. And it, I thought it was fascinating to see how this character went from A to B in terms of uh, Bruce to Batman. I also adored the depiction of his training in this movie in terms of him training as a ninja. After Bruce doesn't get to kill Chill and he, he actually faces Maroney face on, he has an existential breakthrough, I guess you could say, or a moment of clarity. With Rachel as well. Yeah, after after the, Rachel the fight with Rachel. Yeah. Um, that moment of clarity where he's with the homeless man in front of the, the fire, and he's like, that's a nice goat. And uh, <laughs> he realizes that in order to fight criminality, in order to do something good with his life, and to fight crime, he has to understand the criminal underworld. He has to live like one of them. He has to become one of them to understand them and this sets him on a path of vengeance and he goes on to train himself which eventually through the league of shadows and also it's not it's not just to understand the the life of a criminal in criminality but also uh to get out of his bubble he's the prince of gotham uh, like uh falcone says he'd have to go a thousand miles before he met someone who didn't know his name like he doesn't really know the real world so he has to abandon his life as bruce wayne the Prince of Gotham in order to actually become the real Bruce Wayne, who's the person inside that's never actually lived. He's always just been the famous billionaire kid. And so I thought it was brilliant for him to, to, to escape and just, uh, and leave the country. And I love how they established him as already being a, a, a prolific martial artist. Yeah. Because, um, after he has the, the meeting with Henry Ducart in his prison cell and who, and he's freed from prison and he travels to the temple, by the way, the cinematography are, is on display in this movie is unbelievable from Wally Fisher. I think that's one of the definitive parts of these movies is 
the beautiful cinematography, the beautiful imagery, traveling through these landscapes. Chris Nolan is obviously a huge fan of James Bond, and he brought that love of international travel into his movies. He always has. I mean, Inception and, and all these, and, and Tenet. Like, he loves international espionage and, and uh, world traveling in his films, and so he brought that to a superhero movie uh, brilliantly. And the cinematography of these landscapes is beautiful. And I think you said the the ice landscapes in this movie are the same ones as in Interstellar. It's the same glacier. Yeah. So the, Batman Begins, where they're training on the ice, it's the same glacier as in Interstellar, but the only difference is a volcano had erupted after Batman Begins and before they filmed Interstellar. That's why the entire glacier is covered in gray ash. Got it. That's super cool. And so I love that when he finally reaches Henry Ducard's temple, he and he fights with Ducard, uh, Ducard is naming off all of the martial arts techniques that Bruce is using, showing that he has been training for years. We I think that's a great thing to point yeah. out because a lot of people are confused and they think that he doesn't have training, but he does yeah. have training. He doesn't show up there without training. Every time uh, Bruce attacks Henry, Henry points out like you're doing jujitsu or you're doing like drunken monkey, like all these different fighting techniques and styles. So uh, they don't show his training, but Bruce is a highly trained martial artist up to this point, but he hasn't become the uh, ninja yet. And, I think becoming a ninja is what gives him most of the abilities that the, that Batman needs in terms of um, eluding detection and um, killing without being seen or heard. And so uh, I think that it was so fun to see uh, Bruce Wayne training with a group of ninjas. It was just uh, awesome. And Liam Neeson is easily one of the best parts of this film. Obviously, he plays two characters, Henry Ducard, who's a, a pseudonym or fake identity of Ra's al Ghul, who he truly is. He's a superb villain. He's intelligent and evil. And the most interesting thing about Descartes and Ra's al Ghul is he's a man who you can imagine was probably a lot like Bruce when he was younger in his youth. And you can, you can see how he gave into the complete corruption of his anger and his rage, which is why when he's sitting on the ice with Bruce in the fire after Bruce falls in the lake, they're talking about how his past life, he had a wife once, and he seemed like a person who loved. And he, he and also we learn, and we can assume that he lost everything, and that's what fuels his anger and his rage. And and he, he kind of pushes Bruce to channel his anger when really Bruce shouldn't really so much channel his anger, but he learns later on that it's a tool he can use to bring hope and to, to stop criminals. That's an excellent point. I think they definitely are very similar characters, and I think that if Bruce didn't have the people in his life around him uh, to stop him from making mistakes, he probably would have wound up very similar to Henry Ducard because he was about to murder the killer of his family, so he very much almost became a killer like Ducard. And, and Liam Neeson is unbelievable in this movie because he is so fatherly and, and charismatic but wise and he seems just so trustworthy and lovable, and uh, he becomes a, a f not just a friend, but a father figure to Bruce and his his closest uh, friend. Uh, and so that's why I think it's 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 great when he turns into the main adversary of the film because essentially Bruce has to defeat his friend who helped train him and and showed him uh, uh, and, and showed him the wise ways of of their traditions. But of course, Bruce doesn't give in to this rage that. You could say Ra's al Ghul or Henry Ducard represent in the film this this anger inside of him and this vengeance that he wants. And instead of accepting his fate and becoming an executioner for the League of Shadows and joining them to destroy Gotham, he extinguishes his rage by de by destroying the temple itself and and leaving uh, Ra's al Ghul for dead, but saving Henry Ducard, who obviously is Ra's al Ghul. Um, and then after this, he, he takes his journey back home to Gotham. But I think it's essential for Bruce to separate himself from Ra's al Ghul and the League of Shadows by destroying their temple. Yeah, and also it establishes uh, Batman's main rule, which is he, he will not kill. He has compassion, and that's what separates him from the criminals he is going to fight and stop. And, and that main rule has always been the driving factor in terms of, how, uh, in terms of uh, Batman's morality throughout his entire lore. And so even though he clearly killed 20 dudes with that explosion. Aside from that explosion, <laughs> I'm sure they got out fine. I'm sure they were fine. There's a back door. <laughs> but um, it, it sets up his morality in a great way. 
And then I one of my favorite one of the funniest moments of this movie is when he he's on the the landing strip and and Alfred comes out of the the private jet. And he's like and Alfred says looking very fashionable apart from, <laughs> apart from the mud. <laughs> he's like you can take the rolls out but you just bring it back with the full tank of gas. <laughs> but but I love this jet scene because it's important to set up what's about to happen with this character because Bruce understands what he's going to in a way what he's going to become to fight criminality and and fight the organized crime and he recognizes that he needs to create a symbol because as a man he can be stopped he can be destroyed but as a symbol he can't be stopped and it's got to be something he says elemental something terrifying and it's not until when he's at Wayne Manor going through some manor going through some papers when he he sees the bats in the in the corners of the ceiling of the of the rooms and and Alfred says that they nest somewhere in the grounds, and that's when he takes his trip un- underneath the southeast wing to to find this cave. I love this whole sequence of uh, of establishing Batman, and uh, it, it, like we said, this is an origin story. So, like, how did Batman build his suit? How did Batman get his Batmobile? All of these questions are answered in this movie in a really fun way. It's not just one thing. He he creates this this persona piece by piece, brick by brick. Uh, with help from other people, especially Lucius Fox, and I love how how Bruce Wayne kind of plays dumb around the the the, the Wayne uh, businessman, but then with Lucius, he's he's much more open because Lucius clearly knows there's something up about this guy, but not he doesn't know quite 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 what it is. And uh, some of the most fun in all these movies is when like they're driving the tumbler around and and uh he oh you wouldn't be interested <laughs> in that mr wayne <laughs> <laughs> and like when when they drove that tumbler for the first time i was like blown away i think we were like 15 when we saw this movie yeah and it, it's just very fun and in talking about like the 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 chess piece he's like doing uh, get running into a lot of gunfire while spelunking <laughs> <laughs> and in terms of the, the tumbler i adore this version of the batmobile because like we said all the other Batmobiles in the previous movies, they were all designed as a toy. They were the studios were like, okay, make this look the most uh, accessible to kids so that we can sell as many as we can in, in toy stores. And and in terms of this film, like every aspect of the movie, Chris Nolan was first and foremost focused on practicality and believability. And so if you're gonna drive a vehicle through a city, evading criminals and police officers all the time. Obviously, it needs to be very strong and tough and durable and, and very much like uh, uh, built for war in a lot of ways. And so I think they they came up with this brilliant practical design for the vehicle that can tear through a wall and, and jump from rooftop to rooftop and has all sorts of different uh, weapon techniques and, and abilities. And I think that it's the ultimate version of the Batmobile. Yeah, and a lot of the action scenes and chase scenes of the Tumbler are actually miniature sets and miniature Tumblers jumping from the rooftop to rooftop. We talked about it before, but mm-hmm. it's still, they use a lot of miniature and practical effects in this film, which even the Narrows are, are miniatures too, and they built those. But, but they did actually build the Tumbler. Yeah, obviously there's yeah. a real Tumbler too, yeah. so just different scenes. But again, I think it's just a genius idea to have all of Batman's tech just hiding in plain sight at mm-hmm. Wayne Enterprises, just in the basement, gathering dust, and it just it just makes so much sense because it seems like a mega a mega corporation like this would once it loses its like leader would definitely dive into some some nefarious things or not nefarious R and D R and D but more uh, military based uh, operations in in R and D and in weaponry and it just makes a lot of sense and it actually it, it's one of the best parts of the film in when it comes to Batman building his origins, but also I want to just go back real quick to during this when he's at Wayne Manor and he he finds that cave and the cavern and the bats and this is where he embraces those bats underneath Wayne Manor and they're flying around him and rather than being afraid of them like he was in the well, he embraces it and he stands up and he accepts his fear. I don't I think it takes the entire trilogy for him to to deal with his trauma, but at this point at this point he's it's a first step in accepting his fear and he recognizes that this is probably the symbol I'm going to have to use to strike fear in my enemies because it's what he fears. Yeah, you're right. That's a brilliant moment. I, I get goosebumps when Hans Zimmer scores playing and he just stands up and there's the bats flying around him and the drums just do 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 It's great. And obviously it's reminiscent of the well scene, but also I I don't think it's a mis it's a misconception to think that the well 
obviously reflects the prison at the end of the Dark Knight Rises that he's trapped in. So we'll get <gasps> I to that put eventually. That together. <laughs> Maybe it's sarcastic. No, I'm being real. No, yeah, that's what I think about. Oh, man. So genius. There, there's no, I, I could be wrong, but when I see the well and I see Bruce at the bottom of that well as a child, and then I see Batman and Bruce, and I see Bruce as an adult trapped at the ba- bottom of that, that prison, the hell on earth, similar to facing his trauma and fear of those bats and his guilt of his past of thinking he's responsible for his parents' death. He has to face his fear of of wanting... He has to face the fact that he wants to die at the at the end of the third one and fa- and be, realize that he wants to live again. I think you're 100% right, and I think it's not an accident that the, both the well in the first film and the prison in the third film looked very similar. I think you're right there. <sighs> yeah, I got that. <laughs> I got that. And one of my favorite parts about this Batman franchise is, is the Batcave because... Uh, there's ne- there's never like so much technology and computer screens everywhere. It's not like unbelievable technology. Like in the cartoon, it's fine. It's a cartoon, but it's it gets to be it can it could be unbelievable in the other movies. Like how could he ever have this stuff? Whereas everything's grounded in reality in this film, and so the Batcave is just a cave, you know. And he and doesn't he have flies the tumbler into yeah, it. He doesn't have much. It's very simple. And even by the third film, it's still even though he has more tech down there, it's very very simple tech in terms of what he has. And I really love that aspect of it where they kept it simple and rude and crude in a lot of ways. I think we should get into the villains for a little bit because they're they're so interesting. Oh yeah. Obviously, we have Scarecrow. And we already talked about Roz. Yeah. So Scarecrow is played by the excellent Killian Murphy, who, like you said, was up for Bruce Wayne and Batman in this movie, and he's basically. The psychiatrist who drives his own patients insane through fear, again, the main theme of the film, fear, for his own personal benefit, using that toxin that Ra's al Ghul in the League of Shadow uses, which they derive from those blue flowers that Bruce has to pick on his journey to the League of Shadows. I think in the cartoon animated show, Scarecrow had more like fantastical powers, I think. I can't remember, but I, I remember being terrified of him as a kid in the cartoon and Scarecrow was a great second villain in this movie. I don't think it. I think they were smart to not make him the main villain. I don't think it would have worked. I think it's a little too, a little too tongue in cheek to make Scarecrow the main villain. But I also thought it was so brilliant that they made um, the the toxin the thing that creates fear for for Scarecrow because he uses fear as as his main uh, uh, weapon. And I think it was just an unbelievable idea to and concept to use both. Uh, the toxin is created from the flowers that the League of Shadow uses, and um, I th- I know a lot of people have a lot have a problem with the third act where um, the microwave emitter uh, cause is going to cause the entire city to uh, uh, become crazy with fear because once it's released, the toxin will get out into the air, and obviously it's like well, wouldn't anyone who's like taking a hot shower or boiling water wouldn't that make the water? Um, create the toxin and make it breathe the make it breathable but i think that nolan is just asking for a little suspension of disbelief for just because it's a movie and so i i mean i know you can point out the plot hole but i'm i doesn't it doesn't ang- it doesn't annoy me too much obviously it's a plot hole but i don't think it's a big deal it's a bad i don't man think movie. it's a big deal yeah let's go it's yeah. a Batman movie 100 percent. then we have falcone who's the head of the criminal or crime organizations and he's a source of the city's corruption um he, he's also the first villain that Bruce comes face to face with early in the film uh, before he leaves in exiles from Gotham to start his journey in training. And obviously, Ra's al Ghul, the superb villain played by Liam Neeson, the double character of Henry Ducard and Ra's al Ghul. But in terms of Falcone, can I just say, yeah. I love that the mob is one of the villains. It's not some super powered villain who's going to take over the world or has like crazy powers. Like It's just the mob. It's just criminals. And that's what's so great about Batman. He's not he's not fighting a superpower villain. He's fighting men and women. He's fighting just criminals. And I think that's one of the strengths of this movie and all of the movies. And once Bruce puts his suit together, he gets the ears after they get the second shipment after the first mess up with the cowl. And he's still have spares. He starts he starts to not fully become Batman yet. I mean, he's putting on the suit and he's going out and, and fighting. But it's not until all of his fears and traumas and guilt kind of all hit him at once in the third act when when Rachel gets poisoned and he has to rescue her and Raz al Ghul comes back into his life at the mansion at Wayne Manor during his birthday party and 
leaves him for dead like he did in his in his temple. And this is the point after here when Bruce starts to actually become Batman because his home and his mansion it gets burnt down and him and Alfred escape in that in that elevator shaft going down underneath Wayne Manor. And yes, you can look at this as it's a horrible situation because his, his home and his his life and his memories of of his past and his family of generations of Waynes have, is gone, but it's also a rebirth because now he has to officially accept his role as Batman, become the Batman, and go face his fears, face the shadows of Ra's al Ghul, of his anger and his rage and his trauma, and take on this role of the Dark Knight in the city. Yeah, and what sets Batman apart from the League of Shadows is that is that Ra's al Ghul and the League of Shadows believe that the only way to save Gotham is to destroy it because it's had its chance, it's gone too far, and it's gotten too big and and, and become a, a cesspool of, of corruption, and so it needs to be destroyed, whereas Batman still believes that it can be saved, and, and he believes that um, it, by, by trying to clean it up, he's saving it. And so it's these two different ideologies that want the same goal to save Gotham, but they have different ways about going about of different ways of going about it. And Batman uh, believes that uh, obviously Batman is morally right, and then Ra's al Ghul thinks he is morally right because it's a tradition that the League of Shadows has been doing for centuries now. And so it's it's an amazing confrontation between these two conf- these two uh, characters and ideologies. And uh, Batman obviously um, is in this on the side of good in this situation. And I'm gonna keep saying it through this episode. Picture Gotham as a reflection of of Bruce Wayne's soul and his trauma. The Narrows are running crazily with fear after after the the microwave emitter unleashes the toxin in the Narrows, which is basically like the the slums of of Gotham and the trains heading towards the center of Gotham City at Wayne Tower, which will which you can say is a representation of Bruce himself and if he fails he lets his fear and trauma take over his entire life, and who knows what could happen to him after that. But he has to face this on and stop it, just like he has to stop the fear and traumas in his life. Yeah, exactly. And it's a great, it's a great climax. And I love the ending when he and Ra's al Ghul fight on the train, and and Bruce ends up overpowering him, and um, and Ra's al Ghul realizes that Batman is trying to crash the train, not stop it. And then um, after he overpowers Ra's al Ghul. He says this great line. I think it, it might be my favorite line in all of the movies where he, he first he breaks open two windows, one for him and then one for for Ra's al Ghul to to escape and he says I'm not going to I'm not going to kill you, but I don't have to save you. And so it's a definitive moment for Batman where he's able to succeed without killing. And so he's learned he's learned here that he can save the city without ever breaking his rule. And so Bruce is Batman now. He's also Bruce Wayne. But he's Batman, and he becomes the guardian of the symbol. He becomes the guardian of the city, a symbol of hope. And, you know, we have that final scene on the roof with with Gordon, where Gordon tells him some really telling lines. He says, you really started something. Bad cops running scared, hope on the streets. But Gordon also brings up escalation that this isn't over. And that what, what he's saying is this can get worse, and... There's going to be a response to Batman, what he's done to the city, what he's done to the criminal underworld and organized crime. They're going to fight back. They're going to push back in a massive way because his extreme response to criminality will get an extreme response, obviously, with the Joker. And I love how they just tease the Joker in this. And I think when we were kids and we saw this movie, like when we saw the Joker card, we got giddy. We got giddy because we had grown up with the Batman animated series and the Joker is a, a constant presence in that show, as well as the uh, the Batman uh, TV, the Batman uh, animated movies, um, and so the excitement to the idea of seeing a, the Joker in this world with this realism, with this contemporary aesthetic, was just extremely exciting, and I I was so so looking forward to if they would ever make a sequel. But I, I was it's very surprising you look back on the numbers of this movie. It only made three hundred and seventy three million dollars. Only. I mean, if if a Marvel movie made three three hundred seventy three million, I think Kevin Feige might kill himself. He'd probably get fired. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, Ant Man makes way more than that. <laughs> Nothing against Ant Man. Ant Man fans. It's very they're very funny movies. But um, 
I think the reason why they made the sequel was not because of the box office performance, but because of the DVD sales of this movie. This this movie killed it in terms of DVD sales, and it sold a ton of copies. And I think the movie made over a hundred million dollars just on DVD on DVD uh, purchases and uh, rentals. And so uh, the studio saw that even though huge numbers of people didn't turn out to the theaters, a lot of them were buying the DVDs and were, and were fans of the movie. So that gave them the confidence to to green light a sequel. And we also have a great scene between. Bruce and Rachel at the end of the film at Wayne Manor and he explains to her that he's going to build it brick for brick just as it was and again this isn't just a physical rebuilding of Wayne Manor this is a spiritual rebuilding of Bruce Wayne and Rachel tells him something really interesting where she's talking about how he had was he was gone and he came back and she tells him that the man she left the man she loved never came back at all because Bruce has gone through such a transformation. He goes through like three transformations in this film. It's incredible for her character, so much depth. And Rachel is an interesting part of Bruce's life because despite being Batman, despite wanting to do so much for the city and change it on his own, he still is a simple man that that really he wants to love. He wants to have a relationship somehow. He hopes that Batman will be able to end and he can stop it so that he can be with Rachel at some point in his life. Yeah, but she knows she knows that Batman is his real identity and Bruce Wayne is the mask and and he will always be Batman and Bruce Wayne is the alter ego. It's kind of like uh Cal L is the real real identity and Clark Kent is the alter ego. And I I really love this movie. I think it's uh, hands down one of the best superhero movies and it set the stage for for all of the superhero movies that followed it and it changed the landscape of big budget filmmaking as well this is our current top tier patreon shout out list thank you so much all of you for the support every month aaron wadeen asia travis ball riley mcdonald nikayla simeona and his girlfriend caitlin nathan leblonde nate moore michael Caranja, logan schroeder Louis Thomas, Ken J, Caitlin Signorelli, 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 <laughs> Justin, Jorge Chavez, Jacob Kostler, Harry Roscoe, Dennis, another Dennis, Dawson Jalokuer, Dante Christian DiLorenzo, Caleb McFalls, Angel Mendez, and Aaron McArdle. Thank you, everybody, so much for the monthly support. We really, really appreciate it. You're all the best. Hopefully, we keep entertaining you for years to come. The Dark Knight, released in 2008, directed by Christopher Nolan, written by Jonathan Nolan, Christopher Nolan, and David S. Goyer. This film stars Christian Bale, Heath Ledger, Aaron Eckhart, Michael Caine, Maggie Gyllenhaal, and Gary Oldman. This movie had a budget of $185 million and a box office of $1.005 billion. When the menace known as the Joker wreaks havoc and chaos on the people of Gotham, Batman must accept one of the greatest psychological and physical tests of his ability to fight injustice. When we talk about Batman Begins, we mentioned earlier that it changed superhero movies. I think that The Dark Knight changed movies in terms of after this film came out, uh, it changed the landscape of the movies that were made after it. Uh, This became the inspiration for countless movies afterwards and Audiences had never seen anything like this before. It changed the idea of what uh, a big budget film could be in terms of quality, drama, action sequences, practical effects. Everything about it is just incredible and iconic. Uh, This film became a pop culture phenomenon. I think when this film came out, we saw it a few times in theaters. And I remember just sitting in the IMAX theater and just watching the blue credits roll over with that eerie one note Joker theme playing throughout. And I just, and then that opening shot, that IMAX amazing shot of a push in a helicopter shot of the building that the Joker and his assailants are in. Uh, it, it's just unbelievable. And Christopher Nolan, I think cemented himself as the, one of the most dominant uh, directing forces in all of cinema. Not to mention they changed the landscape of Hollywood in terms of, This movie was easily the best movie of the year, but didn't get an Oscar nomination, which was insane. And now uh, the Oscars have 10 
nominations or is it eight? up to 10 up to 10 nominations for best picture because because the dark knight didn't get a nomination and it was a spit in the face basically of chris nolan to me because it was the best movie that year well and chris nolan never didn't get his first directing nomination until dunkirk that's insane yeah i know it's, it's nuts how how hollywood treats some of the best directors out there but the dark knight transcends comic book movies and superheroes this film is so beloved because it's truly remarkable. Everything is incredible. The story, the characters, the direction, the production, Hans Zimmer's score. It's a perfect movie. Again, another great tragedy to to add on to after Batman. And like you said, he opens up the sequel with just an incredible action set piece scene of that bank robbery led by the anonymous, led anonymously by uh, the Joker. And in terms of the bank robbery, especially. Uh, Chris Nolan is a huge fan of Michael Mann, as everyone should be. He, Michael Mann's an unbelievable filmmaker, and he used Michael Mann as his main inspiration for this film. Uh, the first film he was inspired by Blade Runner in terms of the world building and practical effects and, and miniature sets and stuff. But with this film, if you watch this film, watch Heat, they look very similar. They do, yeah. They have very similar aesthetics and style and filmmaking and cinematography and action pieces. And he actually cast uh, one of the actors from Heat he plays the uh, bank manager in the opening scene, and that is just a calling card to Heat the movie. And so he also cast the uh, the Blade. I mean, the replicant, yeah, Rucker Howard, Rucker Howard from a yeah. uh, Blade Runner in uh, Batman Begins. Exactly. And so he and in Heat is hands down, I think, the greatest uh, uh, cops and robbers film ever made. I don't think it will ever be topped. And it's in it's a masterpiece of crime cinema. And so Chris Nolan use that as inspiration obviously and he and the the reason why it works so well is because he made the batman movie of the dark knight not a comic book movie but he made it a crime epic just like heat and this opening scene is phenomenal we have great action set pieces with all these characters and what i th and i think what they're doing so well with this scene is they're revealing the character of the joker and introducing him to us and his personality traits, but they're doing it with word of mouth and rumors of these criminals yeah, and right. what they they've heard, and they explain what he's like and why he wears that face paint, and they describe it as war paint, which actually makes a lot of sense in terms of if you're trying to scare your your enemies and also hide your identity. and And Nolan is trying to ground these characters again in the real world. Like, what would the Joker, if there was a really a person like that, how would they exist and what it would, would it look like? And I, I think he does a phenomenal job with this. And then we get that final shot of the Joker. But it's it's just more character shown of the, of the Joker without telling you by how he hires all these guys and tricks them all to kill each other. So he's the only one left at the end of the job. Yeah, he's the ultimo hombre. The ultimo hombre. And he just introduces chaos and anarchy and meaninglessness in everything i love this opening scene and it showed the joker's brilliance and um intellect and how great of a strategist he is and how he can manipulate people and, and predict people and move them like pawns which he's gonna do multiple times in this movie and also that iconic reveal where he it's this great close-up shot of heath ledger's face and uh, they shot this entire sequence with the imax cameras a lot of this film has imax cinematography um, it was the first major film to do so much IMAX work, and the the initial shot they got uh, when they fought, when they saw the dailies the next day, they saw that the 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 image was out of focus for all the takes, so the they had messed up the camera work, um, and so Nolan called Heath Ledger up that night and was like, "We have to schedule um, tomorrow. We're gonna reshoot that um, robbery scene for this close up shot of you." And Heath Ledger was like, worried. He's like, did I do something wrong? And did I mess up? Or is, is, is it my fault? And Nolan was like, no, it was our fault. You're out of focus. We need to redo the takes so that we can get you in focus. And so they reshot it the next day in focus. They did a few takes and were happy with it. And then as they were watching all the footage, they realized that first take that was out of focus was by far the best take. So they left it in the movie. So if you watch that, that reveal of the Joker in, in The Dark Knight, it's a very much out of focus image of his face. And that kind of adds to the character of this ambiguity of this mystery of who this person is. So I think it works perfectly. Yeah, he's the best villain in the entire franchise for sure. And like you said, he's a manipulator. He's a master manipulator. And he what he does is he he creates doubt in characters and uncertainty and 
he he controls people just words and dialogue and you'll you'll see all the interactions he has with characters where the more that they let the joker talk the more manipulated they become and the more like a like a puppet they become on his strings the more they let him talk like the scene with him in the and all the criminals and then the scene with him and batman in the interrogation room and the scene with harvey dent in the hospital with the joker the more you let the joker talk the more he corrupts your mind and what he's trying to do is he might not seem like he has purpose he does have purpose to an extent but what he wants to do is basically flip gotham and flip the world on its head he wants to to, to bust out some tenant terminology he wants to invert the world <laughs> <laughs> he wants to make everything backwards in a way and and they based the Joker somewhat off the, the graphic novel, The Killing Joke, which is the best Joker graphic novel out there. And there's this great line from that comic book where it says, where the Joker says, all it takes is one bad day to turn the sanest man to lunacy, which is totally apparent in the entire film with his character. Especially with what he does to Harvey Dent. What makes the Joker great and what makes any villain great is that uh, they need to have the same goal as the protagonist. They want, they need to want the same thing because then it creates this conflict between these two forces trying to achieve the same goal, which causes them to clash. And so, he, they, both the Joker and Batman in this in this movie are fighting for the soul of Gotham. And like you said, the Joker's strength is his ability to turn people in uh, up, turn people on their heads, and and turn the sanest person into a lunatic and and he's able to create chaos within the minds of people and i think he's very similar to anton sugar our previous co- podcast we talked about no country for old men and uh, we talked about that character in terms of nobody understood him and nobody understands the joker in this movie everyone thinks that he's fueled and motivated by money and power and greed but what they don't understand is that all he's motivated by is chaos and destruction and all he wants is to just destroy the city and destroy people and and make them turn on each other and he doesn't care about money he burns a giant pile of cash that's worth tens of millions of dollars all he wants is the ability to to create to wreak havoc on the city and that gives him enough pleasure and and alfred says that iconic line some men just want to watch the world burn and that's a perfect translation to who this character is. Yeah, you can't understand the Joker. And if you try to, it's just going to be worse for you. And it's a it's a mistake that I think the, the interrogation scene between the Joker and Batman, it's one of the best in the movie. It's so fascinating to watch these two iconic hero supervillain go against each other and, and just great dialogue. But it's also a massive mistake on Bruce's end because, like I said, the more you let the Joker talk, the more he's going to corrupt you. And he's he's a force of anarchy. He has no rules. He's an, and an enemy with no rules is basically an unstoppable force. And Alfred's the only one that kind of recognizes this kind of person. And he, he lacks really any backstory. We don't know who he is. He doesn't really have much of an identity. Uh, we see him without the makeup just once. The wardrobe is all custom with no labels. And this all tells you that he's incredibly smart, wildly unstable, and has purpose. But he's also like a dog chasing cars, like he says. He's animalistic. He wouldn't know what to do if he caught one. His head's hanging out of car windows. He's constantly licking his lips like a, like a reptile or a serpent or something like that. And he's just such a fascinating character. And it's Bruce's fault for the Joker coming into prominence. And um, Alfred points this out because... Bruce was so successful in in stopping the the mob and in fighting crime in Gotham City. I mean, when the when the movie starts, criminals are clearly afraid of Batman and are even afraid to go out at night because they're worried Batman's going to show up. And um, so he has done a great job of cleaning up the streets of Gotham. But this has caused the mob to turn to him to turn to the aid, to ask for aid from a man they don't understand in the Joker. And so uh, Batman's success. And dominance over the criminality of Gotham is what allows the Joker to gain power in the city. It's not just Batman's success. It's because Batman teamed up with uh, Harvey Dent, the DA, and he also teams up with Gordon and the mayor in the police department where they put away um, all the criminals in that one case. And they basically stop o- organized crime overnight. And what I, whenever I watch this movie, what I think that does is it creates this obviously it creates this massive power shift between uh, that goes from all this this power from the criminals and it all goes to 
to Dent and the police and Gordon and Batman. They they get so much more power. And I wouldn't say that they be, become corrupt with power. Maybe I think they experience hubris and they become a little over arrogant with their power and, and how they wield it and how they use it. And for example, uh, Jim Gordon, he refuses to see the corruption in his own units and he refuses to see the, the betrayals that are about to come from, be, come from his unit because uh, like Harvey Dent says that he investigated people that work for him. Yeah, exactly. And the Joker uses the corruption within the police department to gain an edge over everyone in terms of assassinating the main figures in Gotham um, and gaining power in the situation against both the police department and Batman. And so he, he takes advantage of the corruption that has been ignored in the Gotham police department for so long. And like we said, at the end of Batman Begins, where Jordan starts to, Gordon brings up escalation. Obviously, we have escalation where... Um, the Joker, he's not the number one criminal in the city yet at the beginning of the film, but he has been created because of the Batman's escalation to organized crime. But once he puts everyone away in bars, once they all do that, that creates the ultimate escalation of letting this maniac wreak havoc on the city. Yeah, it's amazing performance. And uh, I, I love Heath Ledger's, first of all, I just want to talk about his physicality in this movie in terms of, first of all, his look is so brilliant. And Heath Ledger... Uh, if you don't know, is was very much involved in the design and look of the Joker himself. He worked with the costume designer in the makeup department and in creating the look of the Joker. So he's very much hands on in terms of crafting all of his characters. And I love the 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 look of the Joker, where like you said, he's got that amazing uh, custom suit. But uh, he he has this this dirty quality to him and uh, this authentic, realistic quality to him in terms of. Uh, the longer he goes without cleaning up, the more his makeup runs down his face and spreads on his hands and becomes cracked. Becomes cracked and just dirty and and falls. And he's like, like when he's arrested, he, his face is just like falling apart. And I love how if you look closely, uh, his fingers and hands will always have makeup on them, as though he he put his the makeup on and then he just didn't even care to wash his hands afterward. I thought it was a great uh, attention to detail in terms of the character and also. His teeth are like ye stained yellow, just gross looking. His hair is not just green, but it's just like, it's just greasy and undone and just a mess. And uh, obviously the, the facial scars are so disturbing to see. And I love this this technique he used where he just constantly licked his lips all the time, all the time. And he initially started doing it because the the glue on his, on his, on his prosthetics was falling off. So he would lick his lips and his mouth to keep the, the the adhesive from falling off. And then he decided to use that as part of his performance. And uh, it, it just became a, a beautiful, a, an incredible uh, trait to the character. And also, I think the most iconic thing is his voice and his laugh. And uh, Heath Ledger just crafted this incredible character we had never seen before. And I know Joaquin Phoenix did a great job too, but I don't think anyone will ever top what Heath Ledger did. And the Joker is obviously a clown. Clowns are tricksters. They're jokers. Uh, the Joker, obviously. And again, his plan is to turn the world upside down. He wants to turn Harvey Dent into a villain. He even wants he wants to turn Batman into a villain, too. That's what he's trying to do the entire film, basically. And he wants to watch the whole world burn. And as a clown, instead of jokes, he uses chaos and manipulation. And one of my favorite forms of manipulation that he uses is just like how you talk about his scars, these, these huge scars on his face. Um... He changes his story of how he got those scars. You want to know how I got these scars? So he changes the story based on who he's telling this to to manipulate that person. So like, for example, when he does it to Rachel Dawes, he's talking about a wife who is beautiful like you. And, you know, she, he gets into this fake story about the wife or another time he tells about his father uh, with another person. With the older man. Yeah, yeah, so he changes his story based on who he's manipulating at the time. And Chris Nolan obviously wanted to keep this movie PG-13 so he couldn't show much on-screen violence, but he, he's very good about uh, uh, showing the, the moments up to the violence. And there's a lot of really disturbing off-screen violence that the Joker commits in this film in terms of uh, during those... Uh, that video that he makes with the, the man he's holding prisoner and you just hear the man screaming at the end of it and the Joker laughing like you, you can only imagine what he did to that man. And he also, I mean, you kind of forget that he burns Lau alive on top of that pile of money. Lau is sitting on top of the pile of money. He lights it on fire, but he doesn't show it. And also um, when they attack the men in that pool hall, uh, 
Nolan cuts away to the reactions of the other people as he obviously slices up the other guys, I'm guessing, like slit their throats and stuff. And so there's a lot of off-screen violence that uh, obviously you want to see, but they want to keep this PG-13 so they can't show it. But I think that Nolan did a great job of alluding to it and showing the moments just before they have to cut in a great way. And obviously Heath Ledger's passing after this film was a, a m- massive tragedy. He won a posthumous Oscar for it, his role. And I know obviously the media spun this and there's obviously the belief that the Joker role drove him crazy with and, and he went insane and, and killed himself. It's not true. Um, Heath Ledger had a blast filming The Dark Knight. He had so much fun doing it. Obviously, he had to uh, take his mind into dark paths to get into the character, but he is done filming. He was done with the Joker. And even He's, while they were filming, he on his days off, he would go to set to just hang out with Chris Nolan and Christian Bale because he loved m- the process of making the movie so much. He was having a great time. Yeah. Um, he was in, he's in production on other films filming, so he he had put this behind him. But, you know, Heath Ledger, like a lot of actors before him, when you, 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 this career, it, it takes a toll on you, and uh, a lot of them deal with, you know, different types of addiction, and he was taking different prescriptions for sleep med- he was taking sleep medication he was taking antidepressants these were things he wasn't taking just because of the joker so it was an accidental overdose of different prescription drug- drugs and that's what happens when you have multiple doctors that aren't communicating with what you're taking and so it's just a tragedy and it was an accident he didn't go crazy from the joker yeah i think that became the sexy thing to talk about in the news was that actor went crazy playing the joker and I think it was so sensationalized and it was unfair to Heath Ledger to make to think that he lost his mind being in a role. And it also shows that people don't understand what acting is. It's just, it's play, it's pretend, you know what I mean? Obviously you have to go to a dark place, but you're not really mentally affecting yourself. And so I think it was a shame that every media outlet spun with this story for so long. For so long and it was, it was just very disrespectful to Heath Ledger's memory, I think. And the Joker represents the main theme of this film, which is chaos, as we talked about earlier. But let's get back to more of the characters. And let's see where Bruce Wayne's at in this film, where we open up The Dark Knight, um, where Batman is established. He's Batman now. He seems like he's been doing it for a few years. It seems like most criminals are afraid of him every night. It seems like he's spent like two or three years going out at night and beating the crap out of people and stopping crime. <laughs> he's been working with Gordon for what seems like a while now. And um, so he's he's fully fledged as Batman now. He's accepted his role. He's still, you know, uh, a little, he still makes mistakes here and there. But he's also, some things have happened that he didn't expect to happen. Obviously the escalation, but also he's inspired copycats to tri- pretend like they're Batman as well, which is not what he wanted because he doesn't want anybody to die for him or die pretending to be him. Um, but that's what happens when you're a vigilante and you start to take on the criminal underworld. Yeah, and I really like the um, how Chris Nolan shows the detective nature of Bruce Wayne where we get a, a few elements of his detective work and investigatory work where he shows up at the crime scene of the bank robbery and we learn that they've been he he radiated the bills for Gordon to pass throughout these these banks to trace the mobsters. So they've been working together, and also there's that ballistics investigation where he repairs the bullet digitally to get the fingerprint off that bullet. So we finally get to see the world's greatest detective in action in this movie, which is obviously done in the comic books and obviously done in the animated show and move in animated movies. But uh, his, the detective aspect of Batman had never really been portrayed in movies before at all, to any extent, at, in any way. And I also like how he goes out in daylight a few times. Um, as Bruce Wayne, but acting out like a a, a Batman type mission in terms of uh, riding that motorcycle to to go to the address of which correlated to that fingerprint. So I like the instances where he's not wearing the costume, but he's still carrying out his Batman duties. I thought that was really fun to see in this movie. And Bruce has also rebuilt Ma- Wayne Manor with the improvements on the foundation on the southeast wing that Alfred suggests. And in terms of Batman's story in this film. Uh, the the Joker challenges him in a brand new way that he'd never faced before in terms of uh, his morality and his his code of not killing. Uh, and he brings Batman to the edge of questioning his code because it seems to be the only way to stop the Joker is to kill him, which Batman can't do. And also the Joker brings about the the idea that uh, all all Batman has to do is take off his mask and reveal himself to the world to stop him, which would end up destroying the symbol of Batman. But obviously Harvey Dent takes his place. And Harvey Dent is a a great character in this film, played by Aaron Eckhart. Great performance by him. Probably his best film. Um, And Harvey's a hot shot from uh, Gotham DA. He's a good man who's fighting the corruption of Gotham, 
city in the courtrooms. You know, instead of fighting crime like like Batman and Bruce do with their with their fists, he does it in the courtroom. And Bruce sees Harvey as a chance to pass on the beacon of hope that he created with Batman. And he sees Harvey Dent as, you know, the white knight, the knight of Gotham City. And he also, he admires Harvey because, like you, like I just said, he admits to, to Harvey that he's the beacon of hope that he can never be because he can show his face, whereas Bruce can't. And it's the kind of person that Bruce wanted to create with Batman through hope. And he calls Harvey that symbol of hope he can never be. And there are many similarities between the two. The two men both are fearless. They're righteous. Um, Harvey is is a lot like Bruce without that dark traumatic past. He's he's all, also taken over Bruce's spot in the love life in relationship with Rachel Dawes. And Matt Damon was actually originally set to play Harvey Dent in this film. Uh, he and Chris Nolan are both fans of each other. They did work together on Interstellar, but his schedule was too busy filming the movie Invictus, so he was not able to appear in this movie. Although I, I, Aaron Eckhart did a great job. I am just so curious what Matt Damon would have done with the role. And I love uh, Two-Face in this movie because, like you said, they start him out as uh, a hero and a, an important figure to the to the future of Gotham City. And uh, there are sh- the, Chris Nolan shows little hints of Harvey and his darkness within and the the lengths to which he'll go. For example, um, when he takes that uh, mentally ill guy hostage who was partnered with the Joker after the attempted assassination of the mayor, um, he does the coin flip toss with the man, but also, uh, yes, he knows he's not going to, it's a double-sided coin, so he's not going to actually shoot the man, but he shows that he has a lot of rage inside of him and a lot of anger when he's pushed to the edge there is a dangerous quality to him, and uh, that, and I think that scene's important because it shows that it is possible for Harvey, once Rachel is, is killed, for him to be manipulated by the Joker into this breaking point where he becomes a crusader of evil justice in terms of um, trying to cause death through um, th- th- by killing throughout the city all of those who... Uh, were he holds accountable for Rachel's death. And while, Harvey's, while Harvey's still a good person, I think... It pleases Bruce that he may be able to stop being Batman and be with Rachel and have a somewhat normal life, helping the world in other ways with his intellect, power, and wealth because Harvey could take that mantle. But to keep going on that coin and Harvey Dent as what and what he becomes, Harvey Harvey's coin is his biggest weakness to me because by refusing to consider other alternatives and other thoughts, he does anything he can to achieve his one goal of whatever he needs at the moment, refusing any other outcome. And there's, like you said, there's that darkness, that bruise that we get glimpses of. And the fake choice, the fake chance of his coin gives him hubris that we were talking about earlier that leads him to pushing the boundaries of law, like kidnapping the guy and interrogating him at gunpoint, which is a horrible crime. And ha- Harvey's power and anger begins to corrupt him after the loss of Rachel. And that's what pushes him over the edge to become the villain Two-Face after Joker basically corrupts him in that conversation. Again, you let Joker talk too long, he's going to corrupt you. And in terms of, and in terms of Two-Face, he starts out as um, this figure who it's like he seems to have a moral compass in terms of how he's killing people at first. Where he's finding people who he thinks are responsible for the death of Rachel and he's doing the coin toss with them. And if they live, they live. And if they... They get the the wrong side of the coin. He kills them, but then he starts to uh, kill people that have no relevance to the situation, like um, the mob boss's driver in the car. There's no reason to, to flip a coin for that man's life. So I think that once heart, once Two Face gets going, he becomes this unstoppable force where it's no longer about justice. It's just about killing everything he sees. We also get Maroni, who's the new head of Falcone's organized crime syndicate. And then we also even get a glimpse at Scarecrow. He comes back in the opening of the film as too, too as well. So again, we have a couple of main villains as well as some other additional ones sprinkled in, in there. Yeah, and I also, what I really love about this film, like I mentioned earlier about Chris Nolan's love of James Bond and the international um, aspect of that, is they, they took Batman and they put him into a new city. And it's not a fictional city like Gotham, it's Hong Kong. It's a real city, which brings the... The, the realism to the to the audience again and I think it was just so much fun to see uh, Batman flying across the cityscape of Hong Kong at night when he attacks 
the um, attacks allow in his headquarters. And I think it was just so brilliant to see this international landscape for this character. And again, like I said earlier, Chris Nolan loves um, tra traversing the globe in his movies, and this is an early indicator of that. And we also get a lot of Bruce Wayne in this film. Again, these are character studies on Bruce and not Batman. There's a good amount of Batman for sure, the most of all the three movies, but we get a lot of Bruce Wayne, but Bruce... Almost every one of his scenes and conversations, it's, it's pertaining to Batman. And one of the most important ones, I think, is is when he's out to dinner with Rachel, Harvey, and the uh, ballerina that he takes out. And, and you Natasha. Know, Natasha. And it's that funny scene where he's like, I don't think they'll let us put two tables together. I, I think they will. I own the place. <laughs> and this is a really cool scene. First of all, for a fun fact that uh, Heath Ledger is actually sitting in the background in one of the shots at the table, at next, table to them. next to them. So you can see the back of Heath Ledger's head, which is just a really cool little thing that Chris Nolan did for the film. But also this conversation where you talk about where, where, where Bruce is trying to get a feel for Harvey and could he be the new white knight that he needs to, to pass the mantle? Can he pass on this mantle of hope to Harvey Dent? And this is where he leads to him obviously giving him all that fundraising money because one fundraiser with his buds and he'll never need a sense his entire political career. But also... It's a telling scene for Harvey Dent because Harvey brings up the Caesars of the Roman Empire who were tasked with uh, with protecting the city. But then Rachel explains to him that, that they were corrupted by their power and they turned into dictators of Rome, which is very similar to what's going to happen to Harvey Dent when he gets corrupted with power and anger. Exactly. So he's motivated with the, by the, the wrong uh, idols, like false idols in terms of the Caesars. And... I really like the plot of this movie, and I think this movie owes a lot of uh, thanks to the movie Seven in terms of the Joker's plot with Batman and the police force because um, just like in Seven, uh, the Joker leaves fingerprints out for Batman to find specifically so that he can go to that apartment during the, the ceremony, which is exactly where he wants him to go. The same thing that John Doe does with Mills and Somerset when they... They get the fingerprints and they go to that man's apartment exactly one year to the date from when he was brought there. And then also, just like John Doe, the Joker plans to get himself caught by the police force so that he can escape. And um, he morally corrupts um, the main, uh, one of the important figures of the of the film, uh, Harvey Dent, just how John Doe corrupts Mills by uh, getting him to kill him at the end of the film. And Batman, he's also corrupt in this film too and again to talk about hubris and and taking control and or overindulging in your power. You just talked about how Bruce goes to Hong Kong to do the forced extradition extradition of Lao, which is insanely illegal. And that's put kind of pushing the boundaries of Batman and what he should be doing. And also he creates that with the help of Fox that massive spying network on the entire city of Gotham with that advanced technology and Fox immediately admits, admits that it's wrong and they shouldn't be doing this so so all three of these characters Gordon Harvey and Bruce push that boundary of power and hubris and and cross those boundaries of law as well to to maintain their power that's a great point you're right and I think one of the highlights of this film and hallmarks of this movie is the the intense an epic action set pieces that Nolan has sprinkled throughout the film um, in terms of the hospital explosion, the opening robbery scene, that truck flip, the whole chase sequence underground. And, and uh, I think that they, this movie is defined by uh, gigantic action set pieces. And I remember the first time I saw the hospital explosion in theaters, it just blew me away, no pun intended. They really did it. Yeah. And it was just amazing that they he actually built this they actually constructed this building it's not cgi and obviously it was empty and barren but they and they really set up pyrotechnics throughout the entire set of it and they even uh filled up a bunch of barrels filled with styrofoam pieces of rubble that they shot out of the windows to make it seem like there was actual concrete and brick rubble falling onto the floor falling onto the ground and it's just an iconic moment in the film, and it happens, I think, at the midway point, maybe a little later, and it just knocks you on your ass when you see this explosion for the first time. And I love that scene, too, because this is, we see, this is after Joker um, escapes, and we get some more crazy. He, he gets, he seems to be pushing the bounds of crazy because he escaped from prison, and now we see him in the nurse's outfit, and he has Hi. his hair done up high, and he removes his mask, and it, it's, it's, it's really funny at first time mm -hmm. you see it. But this scene, 
between him and Harvey, it's very familiar to the scene that he had just had with, with Batman in the interrogation room. And, you know, it's, it opens up with, with violence and aggression, but then Harvey lets him talk and, and, and Joker finds the things that manipulate him. And Joker, he, he deflects the responsibility and blame of Rachel onto the onto everybody else which is amazing so he 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 makes harvey feel sympathy for the joker and and the joker he's he's kind of indulging harvey in his in his philosophy and he has some great lines like i try to show the schemers how pathetic their attempts to control things really are and this shows that bruce is responsible for everything that's happened Bruce and the police are responsible for Rachel's death. Bruce and the police are responsible for the creation of the Joker. And order will only be achieved, obviously, when Bruce takes his mask off earlier in the film, which he doesn't do. Um, but but it's all deflection and manipulation. And this causes Harvey to go insane. Exactly. And that's the strength of the character of the Joker is that um, he uses his intellect and his uh, powers of manipulation to affect his adversaries and so that's how he does it to Harvey but how but then he does the same thing to Batman in terms of uh, the Joker it, he can't fight Batman like Batman's strength and power and martial arts abilities would would always beat him no regardless so the Joker can't get into a physical confrontation with Batman but he can get into a mental confrontation with him and he can man- manipulate him emotionally and mentally and he does this by uh most notably um the, the scene of the two explosions of both the locations where Harvey's being held and then where Rachel is being held. And he uh, maniacally tells Batman the address to Harvey's location as a joke and as a way to of getting at uh, Bruce Wayne on a psychological level because he, he could have saved Rachel, but he, he was tricked by the Joker and instead Rachel died because uh, he, was, uh, uh, he was fooled by this trickster. And so uh, we see that the Joker is able to uh, defeat Batman in these situations on a mental and psychological level because he could never match him physically. And even another example of easier prey of the Joker manipulating people is in the interrogation room after Batman leaves to go after who he thinks is going to be Rachel and the police go after who they think will be Harvey when obviously it's vice versa, which he did on purpose. Um, Joker's left there with that, that like detective who we've seen throughout the film and Joker within minutes manipulates him to get him to attack him and so that he can escape. And so he's so skilled at psychological manipulation and deviance. And I think that people, they might question, why was that cop in the room with him? I think that the cop was inside the room with him because the window had been broken by Batman slamming the Joker's head into the into the glass. So I think that uh, he was in there to prevent Joker from escaping through... Or committing suicide. Or committing suicide. Because if you look on the shot of the Joker when he's talking to this cop and teasing him, there are uh, several large shards of glass on the windowsill right behind his head. And uh, one of them is obviously the piece that he's going to use to uh, to hold uh, uh, as as a threatening device against this cop in the, in the next scene. But before this happened, I think uh, it could be the best action sequence of the movie and maybe the entire franchise. And it's the, um, the armored um, caravan carrying Harvey Dent across the city. Um, which oh, yeah, is, like way before. Yeah, which yeah. is then attacked by the Joker and his henchmen in. It's an unbelievable chase sequence and attack sequence, and uh, one of the best aspects to it is there's no music. It's just like when we talked about No Country, the lack of music in the action sequences makes uh, it more powerful and profound, and the music is the actual the, the sound effects of the vehicles and the explosions and, and the gunfire, and it's just an iconic moment where we get to see, because we saw the Tumblr in Batman Begins, and it was very it was great seeing it in action, but with this one, we can see the the real power of the tumbler when it takes out that garbage truck and how capable Bruce is as a driver in these situations. And it's so great to see the Joker uh, in, in that 18 wheeler, just firing rockets at this police car. And I think they did a, a phenomenal job with the sequence and it was just absolutely breathtaking. The first time you saw it slaughter is the best medicine, but that scene obviously shows even the, the hubris again of Gordon and the police and Batman, where they, they think they've captured Joker on their own. Obviously Joker wanted to be captured, but then this leads to again, Jim Gordon pr- refusing to believe the fact that there's corruption in his unit in this and then Rachel and Harvey obviously get kidnapped, and then we see Harvey becomes two-faced because of this situation, because they think they've caught the Joker, they think it's all over. Um, but then later on, Joker, what he wants to do is he wants to prove that everyone deep down is an animal, and rules are hypocritical. He 
He tempts Batman to embrace violence and embrace killing. He he tells the entire city to kill Coleman Reese. If he's not dead, he's going to blow up that hospital. He puts those two ships up against each other, one full of convicts, one full of ordinary civilians and citizens, telling them to blow each other up before the other one blows them up first. And I think Joker, he understands Batman more than Bruce Wayne maybe even understands Batman fully or in a different way. And that's why he's able to get to the core of Bruce and Batman. And like I said earlier, I think this setup of the two boats with um, their own detonators for the other ship is such a brilliant climactic um, conflict for the for the film because like we said earlier this the, this the fact that the stakes aren't so gigantic makes it so well be, makes it so believable because you can believe that both these ships can blow up and there will be a sequel to the film you know what i mean the world's not going to end if, if batman fails so it, it, it really feels like the stakes are real and also it's a moral conflict within the souls of of the people which batman believes that um, the Joker is alone in who he is and how he views humanity and that the the people of Gotham will make the right decision. And he's proven right by the people on the ships when neither um, ship um, turns their detonator on to blow up the other ship. And I love the I just love this shot of Heath Ledger. You can see the look of surprise and just disappointment on his face as the Joker. And I think it's the most telling moment and the most vulnerable moment for the character in the entire film. And before this, before he goes on the mission to stop Joker at the end in the third act, Bruce has a great moment of depression and apathy. And similar to the to the first film where, where he falls before he, he has to get up and, and face his shadow and his demon and his trauma, he falls after the death of Rachel, obviously, and into apathy and and he has to get back up and face those shadows because he's also thinking, has he done more harm than good with Gotham? Because his presence and his actions have led to this horrible chaos and anarchy and, and escalation. But he has to face that pain. And Bruce places the fate of Gotham, as you just said, in, in the hands of the people of Gotham. And they save each other, basically, in a way. And um, Bruce reaches his final transformation at the end of this film by taking responsibility for Harvey's murders and death after Mar Harvey holds him at gunpoint um, and also Gordon and his family demanding fairness in for Rachel's death because it's about what's fair to him now. And Batman sacrifices himself. He goes from hero to most wanted criminal. And by doing this, Bruce saves Gotham's soul by sacrificing himself. So that Harvey can still remain a symbol of good for exactly. the city. Exactly. So that Harvey remains that symbol of hope. He remains the white knight. That's why he turns his face over so you can only see the, the pristine, perfect part of his face and not the, the torn, decaying flesh on the other side. And this whole story of Bruce in all three movies, he's constantly suffering for the people of Gotham City. Even though he's lost Rachel, he now has to move into exile and allow this false ascent of Harvey Dent. Yeah, and he realizes that... Batman has to become whatever the city needs him to become, whether that's a hero or a villain. And in this moment, he needs to become the villain of the situation. And he's sacrificing his idealistic idea of what Batman is as a symbol of hope in terms of the more powerful symbol is Harvey. And this is going to have very intense consequences on the next film. This the third act of this film has one of my favorite shots of all time. It's the shot after... Batman captures the Joker and he's hanging upside down and they're talking and and the Joker is just still toying with him even though he knows he's lost and um, Wally Pfister and Chris Nolan do, do this amazing shot where um, they're filming uh, normally right side up and the Joker's upside down hanging and then as he's talking they wrote they slowly rotate the camera upside down which makes the Joker face us right side up even though he's still hanging and every time I see this shot, I just am blown away by it. It's such an amazing moment because it's a relative to the character turning Gotham on its head. Um, they're turning the Joker on his head. And it's just such a, a perfect moment in the, in the movie. The Dark Knight is easily the greatest superhero movie ever made. One of my favorite top 10 films of all time. Chris Nolan, probably his best movie ever. And 
I can't. We could spend four hours easily talking about just this movie, but we have to move on to the. Third yeah, we film. didn't even really get into the plot. I know too much. we, we, <laughs> we didn't missed even, a lot. We didn't do a sing, anything on plot? Like, yeah. there's so much to dive into, but yeah. we got to move on because this episode's like almost it's like two hours long. So yeah. let's move on to the Dark Knight Rises. If you like our podcast, the best thing you can do is share us with your movie friends. Let everybody know that there's an awesome film and TV podcast out there. Because yes, we are getting into TV now. Go to patreon.com slash Raiders of the Lost Podcast to become a patron today and support us monthly with a $2, $5, $10 donation. Patrons get specific perks like personalized messages, personalized video messages, and again, top tier patrons get a monthly shout out on the podcast to be immortalized forever. Subscribe to our YouTube channel, follow us on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Amazon, wherever you listen to podcasts, and please leave those five star reviews. Thank you so much for tuning in. The Dark Knight Rises came out on July 20th in 2012. It was written and directed by Christopher Nolan and co-written by Jonathan Nolan with story co-written by David S. Goyer. The film stars Christian Bale, Gary Oldman, Tom Hardy, Joseph Gordon-Levitt, Anne Hathaway, and Marion Cotillard. This film grossed $1.08 billion on a budget of $250 million. Bruce Wayne is forced to bring back Batman and himself out of his self-inflicted exile in order to protect Gotham from the ruthless control of terrorist Bane. The Dark Knight Rises is an epic conclusion to this phenomenal franchise. It takes place eight years after the events of The Dark Knight, and this time lets us see the result of the end of The Dark Knight and what has happened to Gotham now that they've falsely raised Harvey Dent as this hero, um, a false rise as a hero. It, it seems like D Gotham doesn't really need Batman anymore with the with the Dent Act, and I think this is a very underrated film critically. Obviously, it was very successful, but I think it gets a lot of unnecessary hate because I don't think people really understand what the film truly is about. They see obviously the great action, the great villains, and the great characters, but but it's it's a, it's about a lot more than that. And when you finally when you truly understand the themes of the film, how it's about Bruce finally facing his trauma. And coming to terms with it and, and defeating his past and his guilt and his trauma and his fear. You you truly get a, an appreciation for the film. And and obviously Nolan, no doubt, put himself in a, in a tight corner. Because obviously with the uh, escalation that we keep talking about with the Dark Knight. And how he had to raise the stakes of everything. He had to do it again with the Dark Knight Rises. And it's hard to top the Dark Knight, which is a perfect film. But I think he did a very good job with this with this conclusion to the trilogy. I, I agree, and I adore The Dark Knight Rises, and I think that this is just a, a, a massive film in terms of uh, of scope. It's just epic. It's gigantic. Like, The Dark Knight is a crime drama, and then The Dark Knight Rises is just a, a, an epic. It's like a war movie. Yeah, exactly. And actually, it's the, it's the it takes place a, across a long period of time. It's like many months this entire film takes place, and I love the gigantic scope of it. I love the international quality of it. I love the villain. And Batman, once again, is challenged in a new way, and he has to overcome intense obstacles, both both uh, personally and as Batman. And I think that they're firing on all cylinders. The, the filmmaking in this movie is just masterful. Um, this is the last film that Wally Pfister shot with Chris Nolan, and um, they really went out with a bang with this one. They shot so much IMAX, and it's a really gorgeous movie. Um, and this film is just, I think... Uh, one of the best sequels ever made, hands down. I don't think I've ever been more excited to see a movie in my life. It's I got mean, a great trailer. We must have watched that trailer like 35 that times. That trailer each, was dope. Each day, we'd watch it. We'd watch it like five times. We'd be like, hey, I want to watch the Dark Knight Rises trailer. And when we finally <laughs> saw the Dark Knight Rises, we went to a midnight screening. Remember when those used to happen? I missed that. Yeah. And it was a, actually a Batman trilogy marathon where at AMC where they played the first two films back to back starting at like 7 p.m. with intermissions in between the movies and then they they timed it perfectly so at midnight the Dark Knight Rises would start and my god it was the biggest nerd fest that smelled like a locker room for seven hours that I've ever been a part of in my life <laughs> and there's a common con I hear about this film a lot where there's not enough Batman in the movie um, because obviously we don't see him at all until really about an hour, hour 45 to an hour into the film but again, this is essential for the story. The story isn't Batman. The stories are about Bruce Wayne. And Nolan, I think, boldly opens the movie with obviously this incredible practical action scene of these of these planes in midair being torn apart. And it's it's incredible to see. 
uh, and then opening with Bane and introducing his character, similar to with, with the Dark Knight with Joker. And once again, uh, Hans Zimmer created an, an iconic score and theme for the character of Bane, and you you hear it first in the scene, and it's this combination of this this incredible string work with intense drums, and then the chanting of all these people in the background. And when you, when that's when this music is playing and the and the plane is being taken over. It is just so thrilling, and it's such a great opening. It's, I mean, it's on par with the opening bank robbery. In a lot of ways, it's better, too. And I love how, how loud and how action-packed the opening is. And then for the next 45 minutes, Nolan just quiets it down. He calms the film down, slows it down, and we because he really wants to show you what Batman's sacrifice has meant to Gotham City and how Harvey has ended up becoming this beacon of hope and... The Dent Act has been passed, and um, that's what Bruce intended him to be eventually. And this helped put an end to organized crime and, and mostly corruption in the city. But again, this is all superficial. It's all on the surface. That's the problem with, with this Dent Act, and that's the problem with using Harvey Dent as the beacon of hope because it's built on lies, the foundation of lies, because we soon find that the underground of Gotham City, the foundation of Gotham, because it's built on a lie— it's decaying, and there's an underground army that begins to rise later in the film. Exactly. And in terms of how you said he slowed down the film for the next 40 minutes or so, he's also doing it because he's establishing a lot of new characters. We have Catwoman, Selena Kyle, we have John Blake, and we also have Miranda Tate, as well as the businessman played by Ben Mendelsohn. I can't remember his name. And so there's actually a, a lot that he's trying to establish in this movie within the first act that we, we need to get up to speed about. And also in terms of Bruce Wayne, the character, and what he has become. And in a lot of ways, he's become a Howard Hughes-type figure, this eccentric, recluse billionaire who uh, doesn't leave his home anymore. And I think the, the trauma of, of his, his exploits as Batman as well as the loss of Rachel has pushed him to an incredibly dark place. And how you said people aren't happy that there's a lot, not a lot of Batman in this movie. And the reason for that is because it's called The Dark Knight Rises. So the Dark Knight has fallen. He needs to grow back into Batman. And so obviously he shouldn't be Batman right away. And I think that uh, I really adore the depiction of Bruce Wayne. It was very surprising. It was unexpected. And I thought it was really refreshing for the character. Yeah, Bruce is now this demoralized man um he's apathetic and i think what bane really does in this film whereas and so where the joker created he manipulated people with his chaos and in, in his dialogue what bane does he is he creates disbelief he, he takes your belief out of you out of your soul so you don't believe in yourself which is what happens to batman throughout this film where at the end of the movie when he has to escape his prison, he escapes by wanting to live life again because before that, Bruce Wayne seems to be waiting for death at this point. In the third film, he's kind of in this limbo or purgatory where you know he just stares out the window and he's just waiting for death. He's crippled. He, he has a bad leg. Um, just like Batman begins the opening of that film when he comes back after his parents' death when he's coming back from Princeton, Wayne Manor is mostly unused and all the furniture is covered in cloth. Same thing with now with Mate Wayne Manor. And it's hardly ever occupied and he still mourns the death of Rachel. He 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 she and she died with him thinking that she died choosing him when she really chose Harvey Dent. And that's another lie that this entire story is built on. Yeah, you're right. And in terms of Bane like you just said, uh, he he wants to torture the souls of the goth the people of gotham in the soul of batman bruce wayne and that's where he, he's trying to cause uh, emotional and psychological pain with all within all of these people that's his main goal before he ends up before he plans to uh, destroy the city and i think bane was a great successor to the joker uh, it was a, a new take on the villain uh, in terms of the joker being a psychological genius and manipulator Bane is just this unstoppable force of physicality, and we had uh, never seen Batman overpowered by another person ever before on film. I love the design of Bane's mask. It's terrifying and, and practical and memorable, and it just it's just a, a brilliant piece of costume design. Um, I think it, it was genius, because the, the character of Bane, it's like, how are you going to depict, 
depict this character who's always wearing a mask in this world, this realistic world. Um, and I think they did a brilliant job. And I hated the previous renditions of Bane yeah. with all the tubes and yeah. how he's just like a big giant meathead. And yeah. I love this one because he does have high intellect like he's supposed to have in the comic books, which he, he talks about when he's talking about his calculations with the nuclear bomb. They couldn't bring the Joker back because Heath Ledger passed away. But I, I wonder like if, if Heath Ledger was still alive, would he have been in this movie? And I think that maybe they would have found some way to put him in the story. Like maybe there would have been like, some kind of crazy prison escape with him inside the prison he's in and and maybe Bane would have broken him out of prison it would it's just fun to think about like the possibilities of of Heath Ledger's Joker being in this film as well it could have been so wild i think Nolan was going to do that at, in some way have have Joker in the film obviously with Heath, Heath Ledger's death he he decided not to and then he he thought of maybe doing a cameo with with the Joker with CGI and, and past and audio that's already been recorded somehow, but he figured and he felt that it was disrespectful to Heath Ledger's memory to put him in the movie when he didn't film it and with his passing. So I think that Joker would have definitely been in The Dark Knight Rises for sure. Because I mean, Scarecrow's in all three movies. Ra's al Ghul makes an appearance in this film too, so why not have the best villain of all in it? Yeah, it would have been a lot of fun to think about. And also uh, another new character in this film is Selena Kyle, and I think Anne Hathaway is is so fantastic as as Catwoman. Although they never say Catwoman in this movie, they say the cat. Yeah, they, in the newspapers, in Cat Burglar, and um, she's she's so great. Uh, she's confident, intelligent. She's alluring. She's she's very capable, and I like she's. Uh, I'm not sure. Does the Michelle Pfeiffer one? Do they? Is she like a master thief in those ones? I can't remember. I don't think she is. I don't think so. Yeah. So they brought that aspect that traditional aspect to the character and the same thing with the Halle Berry Catwoman she's not a thief at all and it's actually an important character trait in the comic books of her being a master jewel thief and so I, I, I love this character I love this depiction of Catwoman I think it's the best one so far and I love the opening the opening scene with her and Bruce Wayne when she easily overpowers him by kicking his his uh his uh cane by kicking his cane over and then jumping out the window. It's a very fun scene. And she and Bruce have a lot of chemistry, and, and they're very playful with one another. And I think they that Christian Bale and Anne Hathaway were, were great on screen together. Yeah, Selena is one of the main characters that goes through major transformations throughout the course of the film, just like Bruce and Batman. Because at the beginning of the film, she only cares about what she can get out of people and out of situations. And she seems to justify her crimes as some sort of self fulfilling robin hood but for herself in a way so she she thinks that's okay because she's steal. not she wasn't she didn't grow up rich and it's okay to and steal she, and she's stealing from the super wealthy that it justifies it in her mind um and we're also introduced to miranda tate played by marion cotillard and i'm gonna tell you if you see marion cotillard in a chris nolan movie you can bet your ass she's probably the villain yeah absolutely. because <laughs> she also plays a role a double role just like Raz al ghul with liam neeson and henry ducard miranda tate is a pseudonym and a fake name for who she truly is is Talia Al Ghul, Raz Al Ghul's daughter. And she's a millionaire as Miranda Tate who may be able to rescue Wayne Enterprises after Bane's stock market mischief wipes out Wayne financially. And Bruce asks her uh, halfway through the film to take over his nuclear fusion reactor, which is potentially going to be turned into a nuclear bomb. Yeah, and so he, he and Miranda Tate uh, funded this project together before the film. Uh, where they built this reactor which could power the city of Gotham with clean energy inevitably, uh, indefinitely, and he decided to never turn it on out of fear of it being used and turned into a nuclear weapon. And ultimately, uh, we learn all along that Miranda Tate was trying to get this uh, machine up and running so that she could take it over because she is uh, Ra's al Ghul's daughter and is ends up being the big bad in this movie. And um, another great new character is uh, John Blake in this movie, played by Joseph Gordon-Levitt. And um, he ends up, uh, by the end of the film, he's going to be the successor to Batman. Um, and we learn that his middle name's Robin. It's a really great uh, ending for the character. And I love uh, JGL. It's fun to see him in this role. In this role. And I think that uh, Blake is a great character in this film. Uh, and he's teamed up with Gordon a lot in the, in the movie. And uh, JGL really brought it with this. Yeah, and... I just want to go back to Bane a little bit too and just like his backstory. So he's an excommunicated member of the League of Shadows. He's similar to Bruce when it comes to discipline. So I'm guessing he was excommunicated before Bruce got there? Yeah. Yeah. I'm assuming must so be what too. happened. Uh, he's similar to Bruce in terms of discipline, focus, intellect. He calls himself a necessary evil. He blindly believes what he is doing is right, just like Ra's al Ghul. He's an agent of death, great strength, 
his mask is like you were talking about earlier how much you like it i just see so much like animality in it and kind of like the joker like head out the window like a dog bane is maybe an even more powerful animal that they can assume in bane is also it's similar to Bruce in terms of he's full of anger and resentment like Bruce was earlier on before he was Batman. But but Bane's fully given into that anger and he believes only in destruction. And he's also incredibly attached to Talia al Ghul, who's really his his main source of motivation. He'll do whatever she wants and he'll do whatever he can to get her affection and her love because he was her protector at the bottom of that pit in the prison and the one who's is the one who helped save her. Um but Alfred, he recognizes the power of belief in Bane. Again, belief is a main theme in this film, besides pain being the major number one theme. And it's the belief that powers Bane and gives him this super strength. And it's, again, what Bruce will need later on in order to escape that prison. The, his physical body will only take him so far, but it's the belief and the will to live that will free him. And Alfred is is absolutely correct in pointing this out because... Bruce doesn't have that same belief in himself when he decides that he's going to don the cape and cowl again after so many years of uh, uh, being a recluse. And Alfred's storyline in this film is extremely heartbreaking and it's tragic. And um, he is worried that Bruce is going out there. Bruce is Bruce thinks Alfred uh, believes that he's going to fail. And that's why he doesn't want to go out there. But Alfred really doesn't want Bruce to go out there because he's afraid that he wants to fail, meaning that he wants to die in combat as Batman. And he's going out there to kill, to basically kind of kill himself and look for the opportunity to die. And so he's he's afraid of this. And uh, it's a really heart-wrenching moment when Alfred does, deems it necessary to abandon Bruce as a way of making a point to show him how how wrong and the error of his ways and, and the path that he's going on is going to lead to his death. And um, he can't be a part of it anymore if this is the, what he, Bruce wants to do with his life. And I think Alfred's 100% correct because I think Bruce does want to face death. I think he wants death to come. And that's why he goes after Bane, despite obviously the betrayal of Selina Kyle when she when she when he thinks she's going to help him. But she betrays him and, and traps him in, in the basement and in, in the underground with Bane and what an epic fight scene between Bane and Batman. It's it's one of the best I've ever seen. And you really see the true power and ferocity of Bane and his strength compared to Batman. And amazing dialogue, too, in Wisdom, where he's talking about how how victory has has weakened Batman and how he, he didn't know what would what would break first, his, his spirit or his body. And the way he talks is just magnetic. And after he breaks his back, which we can talk about more in a little bit, to stay on what we were just talking about, how Batman wanted to die, he he tells him in the bed that you welcome death. You're not afraid of death, which is why your punishment must be more severe. Because you want to die, I'm going to mentally torture you. I'm going to psychologically torture you and torture watch your soul and make you watch Gotham tear itself to pieces. And after I destroy Gotham, and after your mind is completely tortured. Then you have my permission to die. So Batman, I think, is choosing to die in this film. Yeah, I think you're right. And because when he fights Bane, it's clear that he's completely outmatched. And it's so disturbing to see Batman get just beaten to a pulp like this. And I think there's a moment in this fight scene where it's this incredibly powerful image where uh, Batman is backpedaling. And Bane is just walking up the steps towards him, and and Batman is just he just screams just in anticipation of Bane coming towards him because he's like there's no he knows there's no way he can win, and it's the most vulnerable you've ever seen Batman, and it was just tragic and disturbing to see him up against this foe that he had no a, a chance of ever defeating. And so what what created this disbelief in in Bruce and in Batman? Obviously the death of Rachel. Um, the forced exile, I'm sure, led to that, and the fact that he was crippled and couldn't be Batman. Um, the fact that he's so alone and he loses Alfred, he loses his company, he loses all of his wealth after the stock exchange incident. His nuclear reactor didn't work. And I think that all this creates that disbelief in Bruce, and 
the reason why he he chooses to face death and accept death. But again, it's it's the will to live and regaining belief in life is what saves him at the end. And it's not until he sees what his actions had caused that he dis, he he slowly develops the will to to live again because while he is trapped in this prison, uh, Bane carries out this brilliant plan where he had slowly laced explosives throughout the entire city through concrete, and it's it's an amazing sequence where he 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 uh, takes over the city essentially in one moment when they set off all the explosives and everything across the city explodes from streets to buildings to to all the bridges connecting the the island to the rest of the to the rest of the city and. Um, before you know it, the entire city of Gotham is now trapped within its own walls, and there's no way in or out. And it, it's he's, Bane ends up doing the same thing he's doing to Bruce, where where he is torturing the soul of Gotham by um, providing them with the the false illusion of hope, just how the men in the prison have the illusion of hope with the opening above the above the pit that's impossible to climb up to. And so he wants to poison the souls of the people of Gotham before he kills them because he's he thinks that's the best way. He, th- he thinks it's vital before destroying the city. What he also does is he reveals the truth of Harvey Dent and how the entire city and the Dent Act and the end of crime was built on a lie and it was built on the back of a murderer. And we have this crazy city now that's hell-bent on chaos. It's kind of like what the Joker wanted to achieve in a way and Again, we have this flipped upside down society in in a kind of a realistic way, as as realistic as you can imagine. And we have Scarecrow running this justice system that's <laughs> that's basically about predetermined guilt, and you just go up there to get your sentencing. And they have this exile of of walking on the ice. Um, Bane has flipped Gotham upside down, and Bruce faces is faced with this suicidal fate while in this prison, and Ra's al Ghul appears to him in his in his dreams or in his visions and kind of taunts him in a way, t- talking about how this is what the ultimate goal of his was, was to destroy Gotham. And this causes Bruce to regain his drive and regain that belief. And he starts to build his body up and become stronger and attempts after attempt of climbing up those walls, up the tunnel, up the prison. But eventually... He has to learn again. It's not that this. It's not strength that will lift him out of the pit. Strength will get him f- so far. Um, nor Gotham's destruction will will motivate him to to make the jump. It's again the desire to live. And on top of that, the fear of death. Yeah. So he wasn't able to do it at first, and in the reason why, like you said, Bane didn't kill him is because he didn't fear death, and since he didn't fear death. He wasn't properly motivated to make that leap, but then when he finally believed him in himself and had a, a a goal of saving the city, then he finally feared death and he didn't want to die, and so that that's what gave him the ability to finally make that leap. The fear of death gave him the the power to do it, and also uh, while this is happening, uh, Gordon takes on a major role in this film and like the other films, and I think Gary Oldman's performance is absolutely fantastic, especially after the reveal of the the lie of the Dent Act when he has a really great dialogue scene with uh, Joseph Gordon-Levitt, and he's just chewing up the dialogue, and uh, he, he becomes the leader, essentially, of, of of the people of Gotham while under this lockdown, this 2020 quarantine lockdown in Gotham City. <laughs> they quarantined before it was cool. <laughs> and um, I, I love Gordon in this film. And he he goes through a lot too because no one believes him that he discovered this underground army and this masked man and and the only person who believes him is John Blake and it's cool to see Blake run around the city as as his like little detective and promotes him and he works for him directly and um, unfortunately while Bruce is trapped underground while well, well, Bruce is trapped in that prison, the entire police force also in Gotham gets trapped underground during those explosions. So there's there's no police. But at the same time that Bruce is planning on coming back and building his body up and traveling back, the police and John Blake are planning their escape from the underground world to come back and reclaim Gotham City. And I love the moment when Bruce finally makes the leap and he, he, he climbs out of the prison. 
And I know there's so many people have a problem with him just showing up in Gotham after this. But I don't have a problem with it because, I mean, he's Batman. That's all you need to know. You don't need to you don't need to watch the journey from this foreign country to him getting into Gotham. And also, he's going to find a way to get in undetected because that's who he is. You know what I mean? He's trained his whole life, and he is Batman. So, obviously, it, he is going to be capable of getting back to Gotham. You got to go back to Batman Begins. He yeah. spent years in the criminal under, underworld of different countries, yeah. in, diff- in China, in Thailand, or wherever, and in those different countries, surviving and living there. So, why can't he do it again? Yeah, I think it's totally believable. Um, and also you don't have to see it happen. I think it was very smart where Nolan's like, I don't need to show this. He's Batman. You'll figure it out. You figure out, think of, come up with your own ways of how he got back into the city, but he's Batman. So he's going to wind up back there. And so Bruce comes back and he gives Selena that device, the, the clean slate device in order to help him. Um, and then he, he intelligently turns himself in to the, command of of this new guard in order to reach fox and miranda tate and again john blake's playing that breakout time with the underground police and batman eventually returns officially during gordon's death by exile so gordon is sentenced to death by exile by walking the ice but then the flare it shows it reveals batman coming up and light then, it up light it up and then <laughs> and then batman lights the the symbol the bat symbol on the building which is kind of in a way you can and see that as like a phoenix rising from the ashes of of death and lighting again and and rising from the ashes wouldn't it be funny if they showed him actually like making that on the building for like 6 <laughs> hours if like Bruce like, Wayne was like he's like on Campbell's like painting oil on this building <laughs> cuz yeah that would have taken a long time it like wouldn't it have dripped down but you know <laughs> <laughs> it's a movie <laughs> <laughs> and um the stakes are real high in this movie it's the highest stakes so far in the franchise where the stakes of the first one were the uh, the toxin getting out and then the second one were the two boats at the end and now we have the entire uh, survival of the city at stake with the nuclear bomb uh, as the threat and it's a fantastic uh climactic sequence where we get that typical nolan Three three structure story storyline where three different things are happening simultaneously and um, they convulge in this really great way. It's extremely fun to watch the bat wing in action flying around the city. They actually built this friggin' bat wing um, and they put it on top of a truck and literally drove it through the city. So a lot of these shots of the bat wing when it's pretty low to the ground, that's actually there and they just digitally erase the truck that's holding it. And so once again. Nolan using his practicality to great effect with the with this uh, production design. They actually built this friggin' Batwing. <laughs> <laughs> they built a friggin' thing, and so we have and we have an awesome battle between the cops who were just freed from the underground tunnels against the new soldiers of Bane, and then this pumps me up. Yeah, it's a scene. sick fight. They yeah. just charge, and then it's awesome. Batman takes out their tumblers, and then we have a Batman one on one fight with Bane and a fist fight, and then I came back to stop you. <laughs> <laughs> the dialogue's a little spotty there. But then um Bane and he he defeats Bane one on one, but eventually is betrayed by Miranda, who reveals herself to be Talia Al Ghul, Ra's al Ghul's she daughter. She stabs him like horribly, stabs right? Stabs and gut. twists yeah, it. That thing. And she's Oof. talking about it. it's like the the cold knife that, that hurts or it's cold knife that the cold knife that cuts deepest. Yeah, that cuts deepest and and um it's really intense moment because we learn of her and we learn that because she was, we we assume that Bane was the son of Ra's al Ghul this we, whole time. No, we thought that Bane was the child in the prison. Too. Yeah, yeah. So, so that's thought, what I mean. Yeah, yeah. So we thought Bane was the child in the prison, but really it was Talia al Ghul and Bane was just her protector. But then, obviously, Selena Kyle comes in and busts that situation up and and kill and shoots Bane with like rockets right with the with the bat wing. Yeah, I love. She says that your whole no guns policy. Not a fan. It's a great line. <laughs> yeah, I think this is an important moment because. If you think about it, Selena Kyle really is the the female counter to Bruce and Batman. Mm-hmm. Maybe I mean Rachel Dawes, yeah, but it's really Selena Kyle. Yeah, yeah, although she is willing to kill. Yeah, but it was to save his life. Yeah, save so, his yeah. life. After that, she she. You know. Yeah, because Catwoman has always been a morally ambiguous character, being a villain and antihero and aid to Batman in certain situations, and she has the the opportunity to escape the city on the bad pod if she wants to, but she decides to come back and and help Bruce save the city. No, yeah, so she saves Bruce and she saves Gotham. She's so pretty she, much like the most important character in this movie. Kinda, in a way, she kind of is, and so she has this massive transformation, <laughs> and she's no longer a selfish person, just looking out for opportunity for herself. Obviously, we this leads to the famous moment where where Batman sacrifices himself, and uh, 
I think the most emotional moment for me for this entire franchise, and I get, I get goosebumps when I think about it, is when um, he's saying when Batman's saying goodbye to Gordon. He says sometimes it's just as simple as putting a, a coat around the shoulders of a, a, a scared child, which he's referring to when in the first film when when James Gordon uh, put his coat over the young Bruce Wayne in the police headquarters after his parents were shot to let him know the world didn't yeah. just end. And so this is him revealing that he's actually Bruce Wayne to to James Gordon, and also showing that. Uh, he had an, an imp- a powerful impact on him as a young boy, and it's just I, I get it's goosebumps and tingling, and it's just such a great payoff for these two characters, their final moment together. They've been through so much, and and Gordon has been doing this whole thing without ever knowing who Batman really was, and then to finally reveal himself in that way, I think it was such a brilliant moment. And now back to Bruce Wayne and his trauma, and now he must die in order to transcend his trauma and it's this ultimate act of self-sacrifice that allows him to rise from the fire he fire blows rises. up blows up the bomb away from the city and he defeats his trauma and he faces his darkness he faces his guilt and he finally after 3 films in a decade overcomes all of that and we get that amazing ending. So many people think it's a, it's like a dream ending where when Alfred's it's in Italy, a it's, it happened, guys. It's not like, a dream. He, this is not a dream. It's not a dream. And I just gave goosebumps when when Alfred's sitting at the cafe and he he's got his little glass of sherry and and then he sees Bruce and and Selena Kyle at the table across the restaurant. And then the drums just go. Did you know that scene? Uh, so when Alfred he's taking out his wallet to pay, and then he sees Bruce and he puts his credit card back in his wallet because if Bruce is here, then he knows he must own the restaurant. So he's like, "Oh, my money's no good here." <laughs> That's funny. <laughs> so now Bruce has finally been reborn officially, and he can live a new life, and he can put his past, his past, and his guilt and his trauma behind him. Um, the city moves on as well, too, and the city rises. And, and Batman will still live on in the face of a new uh, protector of the city in terms of John Blake. Yeah, and we have the statue of Batman, which will always serve as a reminder to the ho- to, of hope to the city. Uh, Wayne Manor gets turned into the orphan home because, remember, they lose funding. The, orphans, the orphanage loses funding when uh, Wayne Enterprises has no more profits. And people rise from the ashes just like Batman does. Yeah. I think this is a a great conclusion to the franchise. It ended on such a high note, and I I think it's that that final shot when Blake is walking to the Batcave when he finally found it, like he had the GPS navigator and the coordinates, and he's like climbing through the cave, and then he steps across this this plane of water. It's like sh- like shin high, and then all, all of a sudden the platform rises. And then the drums just go start going, and then it just uh, the platform rises until it just cuts to black. And I'm just like, oh my god! When that movie ended, I was like, fuck yes, this is amazing. I know that if I was JGL for the last decade, I would have been texting Warner Brothers, hey, are we making a movie? Hey, can we do Nightwing? I'm still here, guys. Hey, are, still are, here. We, are we doing this or what? Really, Ben Affleck? Really? Oh <laughs> man, I could have done it. Can I just be Nightwing? I'll be Robin. I don't even care. Who's <laughs> <laughs> obviously everyone thought there was gonna be a sequel to this, and yeah. he'd be Batman or he'd be Nightwing or Robin. Mm-hmm. Um, but you know, it ends. Stories end. There's no need to continue them, and this is a perfect conclusion to the franchise. Yeah, I I love this movie, and I mean, it's hard to pick your favorite movie out of these three. And I think it's between the first two for me personally. Yeah, yeah, it's I, probably Dark Knight. Yeah. But I, I mean, I love the origin of Batman Begins. Man, I love that movie. Like I just I made a top ten list of my favorite superhero movies, and these three are in it. I think they're in the top five. <laughs> <laughs> but I think Dark Knight Rises criminally underrated criminally it's the hype of <laughs> criminal the hype of of the hate for dark knight rises blows my mind yeah i understand it honestly it's brilliant and that ends episode 54 the dark knight trilogy raiders of the lost podcast thank you so much for tuning in thank you for watching raiders of the lost podcast hit that subscribe button and notification bell listen to the audio formats of raiders of the lost podcast on spotify apple podcast google podcasts and wherever you listen to podcasts. New episodes every Monday and Thursday. Support us on Patreon at patreon.com slash Raiders of the Lost Podcast.